Woohoo! Google Image Church thinks that it's the Liberty Bell, the speaker. <laughs> so I found that. Maybe they're hydrophone, hydro speakers. You know what they probably are? Maybe they're um, sonar drivers. Since it's at a maritime oh. museum. Reminder that uh, a lot of questions, so we'll probably want to stay on target for answers. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. First hour is general discussion about digital production, and our second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Today, we're going to talk about what we want to spend a little more time on. So what are we going to do for the second hours for audio? So Monday is usually business. Tuesday is uh, really focused on graphics. Wednesday is audio. Uh, Thursday is video. Friday is more of logistical uh, questions and Saturday is education and of course Sunday is introspection. So those are the days that we have there. 
And uh, once every once in a while, we stop for a week and go, okay, what do we want to talk about? <laughs> what do we want to talk about for the next three months or four months? And so uh, if you have ideas of things you'd like us to talk about in audio, go ahead and put them in. Make sure to tag them as brainstorming uh, audio for um, in, in Mukana and uh, throw those in so that we uh, we will go through them. They don't have to be questions for the second hour. They can just be suggestions. <laughs> so go ahead and throw those in uh, and uh, that'll help us a lot for the next four months. And it really allows you to not only guide each day, but guide what we're gonna talk about for the next, uh, yeah, again, three, four, five months. So, um, so anyway, jump in there and throw those brainstorming ideas in there and throw questions in at the top of the hour here um, for the rest of this hour. This is general discussion. So anything that you have there, we may have some guests coming in in a couple minutes, but we'll go ahead and jump into the first question. Bill, what do we have? First one comes from Jacob Goodnight in Indianapolis, Indiana. And Jacob says, where's the ideal desk location in an almost square room to optimize speech intelligibility and minimize room reverb? Where would you first place acoustic treatment? I go ahead, Marty. Well, the problem with a square room is that the dimensions between walls and between the floor and ceiling, they all equal a uh, particular frequency, the wavelength of a frequency. And when you have a square room, all of those frequencies match and they all build up on each other. And so you have this build up at um, whatever frequency matches those wavelengths for the dimensions of the room that makes it really really tough to get a room to sound good because you'll have these resonances and to put acoustic treatment on those walls to be effective acoustic absorption needs to be uh, the thickness of the absorption needs to be about a quarter wavelength of the frequency you want to absorb. So if it's at uh, 100 hertz, for example, that's two feet thick on every wall. So square rooms aren't great, but um, do what you can. You'll need to put a lot of absorption on all of the walls because if you have loudspeakers, they will be reflecting off the side walls before they arrive at your ears. They'll also be reflecting off the wall behind you and coming back at you. So it's not a great situation, I, I have to say. Hey, go, Bill. Yeah, everything uh, Marty said. Plus, uh, for me, whenever I come into a new room, I'm typically working into some kind of bedroom size thing. I, I used to have a studio that was much bigger and I had non-parallel walls built that way. It was much easier to tune the room and get good results. But we're in a world where we have to live with what we have. So what I've done here is I've canted my system into a corner, not specifically. If I was going to point at the corner, it would not be right in front of me, it would be over to the side a little bit. And what I'm trying to do is just keep those parallel surfaces from building up things. They still will, it'll never be perfect. But behind me, you see big heavy drapes. That is one of my noise abatement treatments. Also, don't forget to look top and bottom. I had a, the worst of all possible situations the last place I lived, hardwood floors, no coating or texture on the ceiling and all, and it was really just a big echoey box. And it was a nightmare, I had to actually put auto poles over me and put big foam baffles up there because everything just built up and it was always tinny and hollow sounding. Uh, I'm much better off here because I have thick carpet on the bottom. I have a popcorn ceiling up there. Those are helping a little bit. That plus the drapes on both the wall back there and over on the right to me that you can't see suppresses some of that reverberant and makes it better to, to work in here. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Easiest thing to do is take the uh, take the room and empty it out, except for you, the desk, and the computer, and the microphone, the setup. Uh, I like to put it up against the wall if possible. I put on the other side, I put up a curtain or anything like that, and then, of course, some sort of padding in the back. And then the, the, first, the first place I start to treat is the corners, but I will not know until I start to hear how it sounds at this point with the desk in there, because then you can easily move it around from wall to wall to get your best thing. And of course, uh, it, think of it like taking a ping pong ball and just throwing it in the room and, and seeing where the ball bounces because that you wanna have that multiple directional sound uh, come through so it's easier to uh, treat. But then uh, then you start uh, creating your treatment from there. Yeah, I'm, I'm in a pretty square room and it's all wood. <laughs> so it, if I don't treat it, uh, I'm gonna end up with uh, something that isn't gonna work very well. So the way that I have mine set up here, if you think about the, if you think about this here, um, the the way it's set up here is that is that I um, 
I'm set up in a desk forward like this. And then I have basically, I have moving blankets, but you could use a lot of different things that go all the way around like this. And they go across the top as well, like, you know, across here as well. So I have, I'm in a little box you know, that's there. Now you could treat that as well, but by going closer to that one, one of the walls than the other, what you're doing is you're allowing your absorption on that wall to be, to, to be effective. So I get as close to that front wall as I can, but I have right here, I have a second, I have a little desk and I have a camera. And then I have, you know, things that are over top, like a lighting rig, and I've got a bunch of monitors. So there's a lot of things that break things up, break up that audio. So as I'm projecting out, and a lot of times I'll put my desk pretty close to the wall, I always want to have an area that I can walk behind it so I can get to things. You can always tell in a production, people have done a lot of production, you'll, you'll notice that there's always a lane. <laughs> they never put their desk right up against the wall because they're like, they, we, we've learned not to do that. So there's a lane that I can get into the back end of that. Um, to make that work. Um, but what what that does is the closer I get to that front wall, the more I have depth of field in the back. So I'm I have more distance between me and the back wall. So that's going to look nicer on the camera, but it's also going to allow the absorption in front of me to be more effective. Um, and, and I'm projecting this way, and it's just going to suck up a lot of that on that end and not really go anywhere from there. So um, that's how I've managed that. But I'm in a pretty similar situation that you have what you don't want to do is be in the middle of the room um you know so so you want to you know you can you can do a you can cant it the way that bill talked about mine isn't that way just from a geometry perspective with what's behind me um but but you can i did that for a long time it's like i had it kind of I, I turned a little bit but i found that with just enough softness around me i could get rid of most of that that uh, reverb so think about those things and ask more questions as you start to work on it good luck next question Roscoe Jones is up next from Madison, Indiana. While visiting a Vietnam War museum, I noticed these speakers were putting out great low frequency sounds. And he's got a link to a picture of them, I believe. What are they? Are they still made? And what is or was their intended use? Thank you for any info. Uh, go ahead, Marty. Well, I looked at the picture and I wasn't able to identify what speaker it is or, or who the manufacturer might have been. Um, but it is uh, it does appear to be uh, a woofer inside of a, a weatherproof bell. Um, now there are a number of um, outdoor subwoofers that are made for industrial, you know, commercial, and, and residential applications. You can find them at SoundTube and others. Uh, this one might have been a homemade um, product. You go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I agree with Marty. It looks like, um, and this is what it looks like if you're wondering. Uh, it looks like kind of an upside down bell facing downward. It looks like a naval uh, department, uh, something that would go on top of a you know, PT boat or something as a weatherproof speaker. Or if you want to get even more clandestine, maybe it's something that could be towed behind a boat to, uh, or behind a submarine to issue. Uh, um, <clears throat> countermeasures, audible countermeasures, so a submarine could pretend to be a destroyer. You know, that would kind of freak out the other submarines that are listening over their uh, <laughs> hydrophones. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, it, the closest thing I could find that looked like it was Bose makes a what's called a Free Space 51 outdoor speaker uh, that doesn't look exactly like it, but does have that kind of large green <laughs> thing. It's not, it's not that, but it is. Uh, but I think that um, it you know, you're basically just moving large amounts of air. So it, it definitely could be something that someone just designed for that for that piece. But it looks like it would be something that was built in mass and probably charged, they, they probably charged 10 times what it cost to make it. Um, you know, those kinds of things. It did, does look like a standard military uh, requisition. <laughs> so anyway, um, but it, it sounds, it looks really cool. I did a reverse image search on it earlier this morning based on the link and I couldn't find anything. You know, it, it, it was uh, it was a really, it's a, it's um, very interesting. Uh, hopefully you can get more photos. Maybe if, if someone's there and this is the Vietnam War Museum, is this the one in DC? I guess that's my question. Is the one, if, is this part of the memorial or is this a different museum? But if you if someone can get close to it and take a lot of photos and what we're looking for is is the you typically there's going to be cast into it some ID uh, names or, or or codes in it. And that would probably help us figure out what it was. Well, next question. Next one comes to us from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. I need to double check this. But in Zoom, does the mobile drop of resolution still happen in a 1080 webinar? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that. Um, 
I think it does. Uh, so I think you go down to 720p if, if a mobile uh, device opens up its video. So I don't think that it doesn't matter if it joins, I don't think. I think it matters if it opens up video to do that. But I'm not 100% sure if that's still the case. It's probably something we should test um, to find out. But I think that if it's just a if it's a non video participant, I don't think that it would I don't think it'll go down to 1080p. Um, but I don't we're, we're not sure 100%. So stay well, we, it's something we could easily set up a test for us. So maybe get we'll jump into discord and find a time we can open up a webinar and see what happens. Um, next question. Jacob, good night. Indianapolis, Indiana's back. What are your recommendations for good quality home office desks for office hours type setups? It must support multiple monitors and some equipment weight. Go ahead, Bill. Some of the commercial manufacturers specifically do production equipment. There's a lot of uh, different vendors at different price points. I've actually had the desk that I'm sitting at for about 20 years now. Uh, it came from Middle Atlantic. It looks like this. It, now it is up in the three or $4,000 range. I think when I buy it, bought it, it was 1500 or something like that. But the, it's very heavy MDF for the top surfaces and even underneath. That doesn't mean you have to spend this much. There are all sorts of uh, potential types of desks all the way down to the Ikea stuff that is less expensive. But for my money, you want something relatively heavy and that has a good support underneath. And if it, this is a buy once, cry once thing for me. Like I said, I bought this 20, 25 years ago and haven't had to spend a penny since. Go ahead, Jeffrey. A couple that we saw, I saw at CES and at uh, NAB. Uh, first of all, at CES, uh, uh, was Keenan Guy and myself. We did a, a video interview from Triple D Desks, which and both of these are sit-stand desks. So they're electronic sit-stand desks, so you can uh, vary the height for that. Uh, the Triple D actually comes with the monitors, uh, tr uh, three monitors and camera and everything that just ra everything raises up, everything goes back down. It's a it's a great desk. Uh, at NAB, I was geeking out over Forecast and their desks because they custom build desks for different types of broadcast, whether it be a podcast, whether it be a live stream, whether it be a Zoom call or anything like that. And they have inline tracks uh, so you can put in arms and camera mounts and, and things like that. And they also have uh, inserts so you can put in equipment if you need that uh, for, uh, for audio or video or whatever. So those are the two that uh, I would suggest. And they're not that cheap. They're kind of high priced. And we have, uh, we're going to jump in uh, here. We have uh, a special, uh, uh, some, some special guests here from Germany uh, coming in from ProLight and Sound. Um, we have uh, Andy Carluccio is is heading heading up the conversation here. Andy, do you want to uh, introduce everybody there? I, I, a small one. Well, thanks for letting us crash on your party uh, live here from Frankfurt uh, at the ProLight and Sound Conference at the Future Walk with our good friends, Mark Coniglio and Max, of course, from Universe. And we're, uh, we're super excited to be here showing vendor interoperability and new technologies, new products, and all sorts of exciting things on our side. So thanks for letting us crash with you. We're happy to share a little bit more about what the team is doing and just let us know how you want us to do this. Yeah, well, give us an update. What, what's new? What are you showing new at the show? Max, why don't we start with you? What's Universe uh, exhibiting here today? Yes, of course. Well, of course, beside of Universe and the control solutions we, we offer, uh, we have a very exciting prototype here. We developed the last two weeks and months together with Andy. Um, it's a, uh, let's, we, we call it VBS control, so it's video broadcast solution. Uh, it's a, well, it, it concludes uh, some functions like Zoom ISO together with a hardware unit. So it's a rec unit, two, uh, two units high. And you are able to enter a Zoom meeting, and you are able to take on full control, and you are able to route all the video and audio signals via SDI, via NDI, uh, and get all the audio feeds via Dante, and you are able to, well, feed them into your meeting or also to extract them. So it's SDI in and out, it's also Dante in and out. And how many channels of SDI? Yeah. Well, cur currently there are eight channels of SDI, um, but we are trying to, to figure out what is possible there? Yeah, it's a super exciting prototype because what it's showing is the fusion of our, you know, our Zoom ISO workflow with the uh, form factor of a hardware appliance, right? Which is really interesting to us. The other thing that's cool about it is that I think it's like, you know, for getting, if you think about it like a gateway service, right? Where you're trying to pull video in and out of Zoom, you're trying to do some controllability, maybe some basic compositing. You're showing a demo with like titles on the outputs and things like that. It's more than just a Zoom decoder. It's actually like a basic compositing system for displays in a space, 
or for contribution or for managing the audio side of things. So it's really flexible. It's all powered by Universe. Yeah, so at the end correct. of the day, right, it ties back into the web and all that stuff. So yeah, maybe you want to share more about like, yeah, well, that. Yeah. In the end, it's Universe running in the background. So you, you get all the flexibility Universe offers. So if you would like to hand over control on your Stream Deck or on any other touch controller, or if you would like to hand it on a web page or on a website, everything this is possible. So we are currently figuring out how to set up this unit and how to, well, get it on the market. That's fantastic. And, and then Mark, you have a, you, you have, you're showing off IzzyCast? Well, actually, Alex, it's interesting because this is called, this area, this special area at ProLight & Sound is called the Future Walk. And so they're trying to bring together companies that have kind of visionary looks into the future about the way things can work in all kinds of different areas, both broadcast, which I know is more of your thing, but also theater, which is more our typical place for Isadora now. So they actually, what we've uh, been asked to show primarily is you can't quite see it in the top of the banner behind me, but it says the interactive stage. So we're actually showing a lot of the traditional Isadora features where we've got real time control over media. But yes, we are showing IzzyCast. I know we've been teasing you for some months about this. Of course, we're a little bit behind where we want to be. But the fact is, we've got an open beta. And I know that uh, Elle has put out the word within the uh, open uh, within the office hours community that we're looking for people to really start using it now because we're at a point where we feel confident that it works well. And the other thing that kind of like threw us off in terms of our timing was actually getting the uh, FastSpring store connection set up that we needed to be able to allow people to purchase to purchase uh, bandwidth from us. But in any case, it's really working well. I think all the actual kinks of getting the video where we want it at the resolutions that we want it and getting the data flowing, that's all really in good shape. And I feel like we're ready for this open beta where we can invite people in to take use of it and let them see let them see how they can put it to use and give us feedback to see how it's working for them. And just to be specific in terms of what's you know being shown, they have a remote uh, PTZ system set up at the office where they've got a camera that they're controlling from here at the future walk. They have remote DMX lighting control and they're also showing like the motion capture suit here as well. So there's all sorts of things that you can do and it's, it's a really interactive demo and I think it's been a lot of fun. The other announcement that we shared at NAB was that we opened up our SDK and developer platform including high bandwidth mode access. So EasyCast is going to be taking advantage of that to be able to get the additional video feeds like we do in Zoom ISO. Um, so as you saw, we're, you know, we're opening this up. We had seven companies last week that we announced. You're already starting to see what the next ones are going to do as Universe is putting out this you know, uh, early concept prototype of what an appliance might look like in the Zoom broadcast style use case or an event type use case. Um, so yeah, super excited to be here. And just to, again, emphasize that the Future Walk is such a novel concept for an event. I think it's, it's really cool to have different vendors and manufacturers all sort of in the same space here, focusing on interoperability and how we connect to each other. It's been a really, really interesting experience, I think, for all of us. And uh, it's very different from like what we were doing at NAB last week. It feels kind of kind of unique, kind of like a first of something that I think could be really interesting to kind of pick apart more and see what's working here. Well, and just to tag on to two things that Andy said, first of all, that's one thing we were waiting on was the high bandwidth mode. They made that uh, official last week, but you know, we, we needed that to be able to truly offer multiple channels of 1080p uh, as we had promised with IzzyCast. So now that's in place and we know that that's working. So that was a really important step. But also just in terms of the future walk itself, I was proposing the other day, you know, the show's open till Friday, but I think we should cancel it, not let the public in and we should have uh, we should start actually hooking everything here up to everything else here. That would be my dream <laughs> is to have a day where all we do is like drink beer and figure out how all these systems could interconnect because yeah. really there's such amazing technology, you know, not only Max's and Zoom, what they're showing over here, but our host, Frank, who has this Make, o Make Pro X, these modular controllers with OSC. I put that into Isadora like that and we were controlling IzzyCast. We're controlling the PTZ cameras with Frank's uh, equipment, but I want to see more of that to see how all of these worlds could somehow collide in a really interesting and we're, way. And we're sending our Zoom ISO NDI feeds to the TriCaster over here from a local vendor. I mean, everybody's playing with everybody else's stuff. Well, that was <laughs> that was the funniest thing was I in Isadora in the NDI Watcher actor that allows you to bring NDI in. I clicked on it to find my feeds, and it also and I clicked on it, and the menu went off the screen <laughs> because there were so many simultaneous NDI feeds on the same channel. That yeah. blew my mind. It was a lot of fun. So we're having a good time, as you can tell. But you know, it's kind of a it's been an interesting concept. We want to give you guys the opportunity to get some access into some of the news and see what questions you have. Yeah. Does it do do, uh, do the, any of the panelists have any questions specifically? It's. Uh, I think that we've we've covered it all here. I think that one of the things that I what I was looking at when I was when you were talking about 
needing to stop early is we just need to build a new kind of uh, event where we are all in a room and we're just like hacking. You know, So we've got Universe right. over here. We've got Isadora over here. We've got all the bits and pieces. And, and how do we just have a, a hackathon and we just put it on zoom, let everybody ask questions while we're working, show results. There's a, there's, there's a, there, there's kind of a unconference there that wants to happen. I think, uh, which if only I had a stage. <laughs> <laughs> no, definitely. And you know, it's funny that you say the hackathon where I, I resonate with that a lot because, you know, just yesterday we got word that one of the presenters for our, our, uh, our panel here was going to be remote and they were going to be speaking German and the person interviewing them was going to be speaking in English. So we took Zoom's automatic caption interpretation system, built that into our output for Isadora. And now we have that on displays running in here. So now people who don't even speak the same language can have a real time conversation across time and space. It's like, it's just amazing to be able to feel like, yeah, it's one button away. We just, you know, we never, we didn't come here thinking that we were going to do that, but we just turned it on and it worked great. And it was really cool to see. So, you know, it's a lot of fun to be able just to have a lot of, you know, cool people in the same space with cool, cool technology, cool toys, and you get to play with each other a little bit and do some fun stuff. So. And, one of, and one of the reasons that I was really excited to have you come on is that I think that we're right at the very beginning. I know that we felt like we were at the beginning earlier, but I think that with a lot of, <laughs> a lot of these uh, tools that are now being made available, we're right at the very beginning of how events change, you know, and, and where, so the things that we're, we're, we're going to remember this, this conversation of like, look at, look at the, the thing that we have set up with universe where we can get a couple outputs out and we can control the graphics and look at Isadora and, and how we're, how we're putting these together two years from now, three years from now, this, we're going to see big events running with these, these tools. And I think that it's, it's really exciting to see because I think that, you know, obviously COVID caught everybody by surprise, but now everybody's kind of, all that technology is kind of coming up and we're still seeing a lot of events, you know, struggling to figure out what they're going to do next. And I think that, that this is going to be a, a, a big piece of how they incorporate the, what I would say the 99.99999% of the addressable market that people are not actually reaching right now. So it's also, Alex, it's really interesting for me to think about, as you say that too, that how COVID itself pushed forward certain modes of working that never would have happened without right. it. I mean, we're in a completely different place today than I ever would have expected because of that. Yeah, no, absolutely. It kind of fractured something and what's built, what's growing up in, in, into that crack, I think is gonna be really interesting. So thank you so much for jumping in from, uh, from Germany. Yeah, thanks for letting us interrupt you. Yeah, it's <laughs> fantastic. Like, I just thought it was so cool. Andy was like, "Do you want to do what? Do do what? Should we come in?" I was like, "Yes, yes, yes, we should." <laughs> so, so anyway, we hope to do more things like this where we just are just jumping in from some location that, that that's interesting. Maybe Infocom, other other things like that. So we'll uh, we'll take we'll look at where we can do this in the future. Oh, thanks so much, guys, and have a great show. Yeah, we'll yeah, look forward thank to seeing you. you. Yeah, thank you. All right, thanks, bye everybody. Bye. Thank you very much. All right, bye -bye. see you later. Bye -bye. Well, that, was that was pretty awesome. Yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> All right, let's go into the next question. Next question comes to us from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Paul says, if your car or truck, what is the optimum mobile phone setup, the best bang for the buck for being in a Zoom meeting, including a mount, a speaker, a microphone, or a headset? And can you feed your car LCD display to Zoom? I'll go ahead, Courtney. Uh, concerning the last part, I don't think you can, and I would look at your local laws. Now, in Texas, it may be, you know, they have drive through liquor stores in Texas, so I wouldn't put it past them that you can use, uh, uh, be on a Zoom call while you're driving. But uh, there's cheap uh, interfaces for iPad mini might be a way to go uh, to get the Zoom in and running or an Android tablet. And with Android, you can do Android Auto Wireless, and that might be able to get you into the display of your car but not necessarily get your car's display into the pad. This little mount cost about 77 bucks. Uh, so that's a pretty cheap way. Uh, I don't think there's anything, you know, you, and of course you can pair that uh, with a Bluetooth headset. Uh, and you, but in the middle of your car, you, know, you might want to put it on the uh, Bluetooth system of the car instead of onto a headset to, to make it work a little better. Good morning. Yeah, there's Bluetooth uh, to your car's sound system from microphone and speaker, although the <clears throat> echo cancellation really kind of doesn't work in Zoom. I, I found that, that uh, the hard way. Um, and uh, Android Auto or Apple Auto, whatever, that kind of, you know, locks you out of controlling the, the device itself and, and puts everything in your car and that limits what you can do while you're driving. Um, 
also depending on the vehicle you have, um, a lot of manufacturers are using AVB for transporting audio and video to different devices, displays and speakers in the back seats for passengers and stuff like that. So it's really going to depend on the vehicle. In terms of mounting, um, you've got um, RAM mount is a very popular and really rugged system to use and very flexible. There are components. You put these things together like building blocks or tinker toys or Lincoln logs, if you're of a certain age. Um, this one has a suction cup and this arm here, there are different lengths for this arm. So you can reach uh, to a deep uh, windshield if you want to. There's also, um, uh, a unique uh, kind of mount that can fit into your drink cup holder uh, next to you and then extend that arm as ha uh, high as you want. And then you can get, um, for these suction cups, you can get mounts that have two or three suction cups, and then you can put one or two devices on it. Um, so it's, it's a pretty good system to use. Next question. Next one comes from Greg Gibson in Washington, D.C., and Greg asks, After a recent update, my M1 Mac Mini will no longer display video on my second monitor. The monitor is connected via Thunderbolt. If I switch to the HDMI port, the monitor works, but how do I get my dual display back? Uh, note there is only one HDMI port. Uh, I would look at the cable. Uh, look at look at what cable you're using for that. So it's a, it's a are you using a converter? So are you using an Apple uh, converter or are using a, a uni cable is what I use for most of these things, and those seem to work. But the um, when something stops to work stops working after an update, it's usually the cable, and it usually means that there's some thing that it's not doing that that they're asking for. So, so it, you got want to make sure that um, you know try an Apple adapter or the, the I, I don't know why, but the uni cables for me work really well. I'm using a lot of them on the latest operating system right now. So, uh, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, also make sure that you open the displays thing. I don't know if you're on a Mac or PC. I don't think I read that in there. Oh, M1 Mac. So you're on a Mac. Uh, open the displays thing and you should get uh, a list of everything that it sees out there, including whether or not something hooked up to... Uh, it's very intelligent. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. If you have an HDMI or you have some alternative connection like a Thunderbolt monitor, that in it is smart enough should be looking out and seeing everything that'll tell you whether or not the signal's coming in you just don't have it patched right or whether it's not actually reading the signal from that oh, device and, and and one thing that i would say here is that it's it's connected via thunderbolt so i'm assuming you're using an lg monitor and that you're connecting or or some monitor that, that is direct thunderbolt to thunderbolt uh, you may want to try um, a USB-C to HDMI cable or adapter just to see if that works um, to make sure that there's not something going on with the Mac. But there shouldn't be any, it should see the second one just fine. Um, but almost when something doesn't show up like this on an, a Mac, it's almost always the adapter or the cable. Um, next question. Craig Kadoki in Toronto, Canada. Has anyone used Tentacle products? This Track E looks amazing. Up to 32-bit float recorder with timecode sync in the size of a wireless body pack for under $500. And he's got a link there. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, yeah, I've, I've been looking at this and, and I see some good pros and I see some good cons in here. Uh, first of all, it's 32-bit float. Uh, so, uh, and of course, you can pair it up with your cameras. You can pair it up with your computer. You can run, <clears throat> excuse me, by recording the tracks. You can then put it in to do a multi-track uh, edit from there. And of course, it gives you about 30 hours of recording time. Those are the pros. Here's the cons that I have. The first one is it's in mono. You can't do it in stereo. Second thing is the controls are on the phone. They're not on the unit itself. So if your phone goes down or you start getting phone calls and you get interrupted on the app, you're, you're having a hard time trying to control it. Third thing is it's got lav mics to it. And when I do recording, I like to have a handheld mic. If I'm recording music, I don't want to use lav mics to record music. I want to use a boom, uh, boom mic or something like that. Uh, and the other thing is it doesn't have a switch from microphone to line. So if you plug directly into a computer to get, uh, to get audio, uh, you're just going to get uh, one or the other is going to be uh, totally clipped out. Uh, it's Bluetooth connection. Bluetooth 5 connection, so that can always cause problems from where you're uh, recording on. Although they have something called a jam sync cable. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but uh, it, that, that's the counter. But I still think that the transmitters are running through Bluetooth. The jam sync cable so you can jam its time code because that's what Tentacle really specializes in. Um, it, the 
Uh, yeah, it, it looks interesting. I guess it doesn't have a transmitter. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I thought uh, also Deity um, showed something like this at their at their booth at NAB, I believe, that was a separate recorder, 32-bit recorder, uh, that interfaced with uh, their uh, timecode, uh, little timecode boxes via Bluetooth. So it would jam sync and do uh, timecode. And of course, there's Zoom's F2, which has been out for a couple of years now, which is a, uh, I think it's 32-bit uh, pocket recorder like this with a record button on. It's only about 149 bucks. You can plug a microphone into it, has headphones on it for monitoring, and it records a uh, nice 32-bit uh, sound. Yeah, I think that the, the, ad the advantage of this, I think, but really no is, it. yeah, I think that it's, it, it looks like it doesn't have transmit. I was like, how do I monitor it? But it has a headphone jack that you can monitor. So you can have the mic in there. You can also have a headphone jack in. Um, so you can hear what you're doing. 32-bit uh, gives you a lot of room to make errors <laughs> because there's a lot of range there to work with. Um, it is very compact. Um, and I think that one of the potential advantages of this is that it's just very, it's time code or, or sync enabled. So it, it understands time code. A lot of these less expensive ones or smaller units that are set up in this form factor and this price point don't really do time code. You know, so if you're really looking for something that's really small, that's going to do that recording, it does look like a kind of an interesting um, thing. It'd be fun to play with it. At $500, I'd, I'd have to really need, know where I'd need to put it, I think is the is the challenge that I would have. But, but I, it, you know, they do make a lot of great products. I mean, I think, I think Tentacle has been, we've, we've used them and been very successful with it. Um, I know some people are, you know, use other things like Ambient and other, other time code products. Um, the Tentacle has, is a little less expensive and I haven't had any, you know, I can't, I don't have any personal issues with it. <laughs> so no, next question. Next one comes from Peter Moore in Auckland, New Zealand. It says, given the prevalence of guitar amp power soaks, the UA Aux, my Hughes and Kettner Grand Meister amp with a red box built in, has 0, 1, 5, 20, and then full 40 watts, and two notes built in to other amps. Are the Hendrix Led Zepp stacks a thing of the past? Good morning. So what a power soak does, for those who aren't familiar, is it um, it takes the amplifier output that would normally go to a loudspeaker and drops it down to a line level so it can be input to a mixing console. And that way, um, the audio that you're getting from the amp includes all of the warmth and distortion of the built-in amplifier, uh, whereas a line level output from the preamp is going to be very clean. So um, this gives the audio engineer a way to include the sound of the actual amplifier uh, that they're that they're using, um, and so that's what these power soaks do. So does that eliminate the need to have large speaker stacks on stage? Well, you know that's that's actually an aesthetic. Um, they may be using all of those speakers. They may not be using all of those speakers. The audience really doesn't know, but it's the look that the artist wants to have on stage. So, and, you know, it's up to them. Next question. Next one comes to us from Jacob Goodnight in Indianapolis, Indiana. Doug Johnson just released a new Telestration software called Sketchpad Beta with many features beyond basic Telestration. However, it is Windows only. Any thoughts? And he's got a link there. I go ahead, John. I just watched this video that Doug produced yesterday on his channel on YouTube. And uh, I just thought it was super weird that he relaunched and refactored this code. And Alex is getting ready to to release his product and they're 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 similar uh doug's got a bunch of additional features in there that i don't think alex is going to have uh yeah. but the big big things is windows only and yes. this is a monthly subscription which i think is crazy yeah i i, I think that um i i, I applaud doug <laughs> for putting this together i'm not going to build a windows version <laughs> so 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 the uh we're, we're not going to build a windows version with the one c robles and i so um so having a windows version i think that it is uh you know, it's probably a little expensive, you know, for, for what, for what it is, um, to, to do that. But, uh, but I think that he's got a bunch of tools in there and got alpha channels, um, you know, shapes. Uh, those are things that I'm probably won't add mostly because I, you know, for me, I, there's only so many things I can keep in my head as a, as a speaker and mine's really built around, I'm speaking live in front of people and I need to be able to be present and I needed to not, you know, I, I think, you know, Juan and I have packed as about as many features in as I can, as, as a speaker, as I can keep in my head. So, um, so I think that, uh, so I think that that's going to be, uh, you know, there's a different, different opinion, but I think that 
his um his his uh product i think will do really well on on windows so um so i think that uh, it's it's going to be interesting to see how it goes but i'm i'm uh i i don't think i i doubt maybe, maybe i don't i don't think i had any effect on it i think he's just been working on it he's been working on it for a while um i do think that probably I'm glad that telestration is becoming a thing. <laughs> so, so, or, you know, that's becoming easier. It, it has been up until, uh, you know, up until office hours really started. I don't, I didn't really see a lot of things doing that in a cost effective way. Um, so I'm really glad that, that we're starting to see it, see it actually roll out because I think it's a big piece of how we can communicate. You know, there's, there's a, that, this kind of digital whiteboard or, or um, I always think of it as like a digital overhead. You know, a lot of us are old enough to grow up where we had overheads in school and someone would put a, a transparency over top of what they're talking about, but now that can be video and lots of other things. And so, so I'm, I'm excited to see it. So I hope, uh, I hope Doug does do well. Next question. Next one comes to us from Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas. Some of Lex Friedman's shows are four to six hours doing a single interview. Is there room for long form interviews on office hours? And what is the success formula for a long form interview? I go with John. So the majority of Lex's interviews are about two hours. Lex got his start on Joe Rogan. I think Rogan is the one that restarted the long format. Um, and then and Lex has been on there twice on Rogan. Uh, Lex is great. I've been watching it when it was called the Artificial Intelligence Podcast. And then he changed his name right before Artificial Intelligence blew up. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> uh, go ahead, Jeff. I think as far as office hours, obviously Alex will, will talk about that, but it, it's fascinating for me at least what a, <clears throat> how much of a division there is now in terms of the, the content length, you know, on one side of the spectrum, we have shorts and, you know, I watch plenty of them and, and I mean, talk about attention span. Sometimes I won't even watch the, the full short. Exactly. I mean, that's how, like, that's, whoa, that looks like it's, a, it's like, a, that's like 45 seconds of this. I don't know if I can come right. Like, that. okay. I, I've had an enough of that. I mean, that was the first 15 were great. But then I also watch lots of long form stuff. And the great thing, for instance, YouTube, you know, if you have YouTube premium where it's can play in the background and, and it'll remember where it left off, you know, that's a, a, a multi time of day thing. You know, I'll listen for 20 minutes here and 30 minutes here and maybe tomorrow the next 40. So, so that's fine. Long form is great because I could just pick up where I left off. The trick, of course, is is maintaining interest for four to six hours. I mean, that's a really unique thing. It takes a really good host and a really great guest to be able to maintain attention for that long. But but I think there's room for, for both in long form. And we've done long form here before um, you just really have to think about the programming so we had used to have the long day uh saturdays were the long day and those things would last sometimes eight hours you know six to eight hours of us doing one thing after another um and so i think as as has been said already it's keeping it interesting that long is the hard part <laughs> you know like you know every, you know for a, especially if you're doing it regularly i mean when you think about it we're generating two hours a day, you know, I don't know how often, how often is Lex's show? Is it daily or is it weekly or no, monthly? No, it's like once every other week. Right. So, so we're producing the same, if you, if you pack ours together, we're producing more content <laughs> than that. Um, but, but uh, again, it's, it is, uh, it's, it's hard to structure. So um, I think that that's the big thing. I don't, I can't think of anything I've la l listened to for four to six hours straight as, as far as a single show um, in, ever <laughs> you know, so so i that's the only problem that i would have with it uh next question brett bellew of appleton wisconsin up next could anton bauer's titan base provide continuous power to a camera with a dummy battery if the titan base stays plugged in to power looking to use it at my desk with a sony a7 mark IV, and he's got a link there to the anton bauer product go ahead, jeffrey I'm not sure why you'd want to do that. I mean, the this, the Sony has a battery in it to begin with, so having it plugged in directly into the wall, if you have multiple power outages or if you're uh, running off of battery a lot, then uh, then you could plug it in from there. But uh, for the most part, I would guess that it would power it would charge as it's uh, as it's powering the camera. But uh, for three hundred fifty nine dollars, it's it's not it's worth giving it a try. It's on Amazon. You can get it and try it out. If it doesn't work, you can send it back. 
Yeah, I, I, it's not good for the battery to do that. <laughs> so, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily spend three hundred fifty dollars on a battery and then pass voltage through it all the time. I mean, we do that with you know, and, and I. Th so I would be, um, I don't, I don't think I would do that. It might be able to do it, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't go down that path. I will say, wow, what a base! Like I didn't even know this existed until you asked this question this morning. I opened it up. I was like, what the what? The it looks like a great design. Um, I, it's really exciting to see Anton Bauer, you know, evolve a little bit because they've been really, you know, they're in in my world. They're very popular to put big batteries on the back of cameras and and so on and so forth. And so we we've used a, I've used them a lot, but it didn't really feel like they were playing in this space. And for to have kind of the Anton Bauer technology into something that's very mobile and it looks like they've really customized this to work well with many, many different cameras. I think it was an incredibly smart move on their end um, to figure that out. I wish their website was a little bit clearer of which cameras are compatible with which. They just kind of list the battery things. And I'm like, okay, it would be great if you gave me a list of which cameras that you're talking about. Um, so they don't do that very well. But at the same time, I think the idea of what they're doing, it's a, it's a sleek design. It, it sits underneath the camera as opposed to one side. It's got, it's going to take a lot of power. I think it's a great, great, really great product, um, or I haven't used it yet, but I, it looks like a great product and I have a lot of confidence in Anton Bauer. So it's really interesting. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I don't think it would work as you're describing it by plugging a dummy battery in, uh, which doesn't have a battery in it because most of those type uh, lithium ion type chargers are not designed to directly power the camera. They'll charge a battery because they talk to the battery and they monitor the battery and they control their voltage based on the information coming back from the battery. So if you're not plugged into a real battery, I don't know if it would even deliver a voltage. So I'm well, not it's sure. Well, it is a dummy matter. battery itself. That's how it's delivering it to the to the camera. Um, so the camera, if oh, you I look see. at the, the Anton Bauer, it, it comes out and has one of these little batteries that just pops in. So it it's going into the, the, the problem. So it takes the place of a regular Anton Bauer. Battery no, it takes the place a, of a regular Sony battery. So you pop the, the opening of your Sony open and you slide that up into it. And then that that's how it works there. But it, it's, um, I mean. Right. But yeah. but it has lithium ion batteries built into it or not? Or well, the Anton Bauer an is a battery. The Anton, Anton Bauer, Bauer, Bauer is battery. itself is a battery. What goes into the camera is just a little thing that looks like a battery, but it delivers the voltage from the Anton Bauer larger battery. So. Well, that's what, that's what I'm talking about. This uh, this device here has a battery in it. I know you're right, but I'm saying it has right. it does a D tap out of there into a little battery. If you look at the adaptions oh, okay. for the Sony, it has a little dummy battery that goes in that takes the voltage from that larger battery and puts it in there. So uh, next question, but it looks great. Hopefully, we'll get one and test it. <laughs> next question. Jeffrey Powers, Madison, Wisconsin, here on the panel. Epic Light Media turned two TVs into, fate, into a fake window for video production. Thoughts on how you might approach this concept? And he's got a link there. Uh, I wasn't able to look at it before the show. Jeffrey, can you give us a little description? Yeah, it was a, it was a fun little thing. They're, they're doing interviews, and they wanted to give it a... Uh, a at home approach. Uh, so they, they made this fake window. They took uh, two, I believe they were 60 inch TVs and they put them on their sides and they put a, they put it in an old matrix, hooked it up to a computer. And uh, so they can do different scenes. Of course, they have a corner scene for a lot of their interviews. And then they did a lot of lighting tricks to bounce the light onto products as if a window was there shining light through. So uh, they did a great job on on setting that up, and you know, I, I was seriously thinking about uh, doing this. And it just, I don't have the set of lights that they have in their studio, and I was thinking uh, of other ways to make the same effect happen. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, I've seen a couple of uh, uh, YouTube videos like this where people who have a, a dungeon basement, you know, or gaming basement that they turn into their man cave, but it has no windows in it because it's underground. And they'll take three 60-inch monitors and put them vertically side by side and run little uh, thin strip mullions down between them like uh, windows mullions and then have uh, a bunch of videos that they shoot to uh, span the three monitors horizontally so it looks like a single scene and so they can you know, have a picture of the Golden Gate Bridge or anything you want outside your window, a nice mountain view. Uh, the thing is you have to remember is that most of those monitors are balanced for 5600K, so if you're going to be shooting this uh, with a camera uh, and you want it to look color correct out the window, you should probably light with 5600K because... When you color correct those videos 
it gets a little squirrely as far as off-axis goes if you try and correct them to tungsten because you're killing about 90% of the blue coming out of there. Go ahead, Marty. Yeah, being in Washington, D.C. here, um, every everybody who's interviewed, being interviewed wants to sit, you know, in front of a window that has a view of the Capitol behind it. And, you know, those limit, those views are really limited. So a lot of insert studios have these monitors, these large monitors that sit right behind the chair and um, has that view in it. So this is a concept that is not really new, but uh, employing it for a different kind of market is, is a novel idea. Um, with the lighting added for special effects uh, is really cool. So um, uh, when you're watching a news program, evening news, whatever, and you're seeing the corporate set behind it with the show logo and all that, that's a video monitor. It's not a, not really a practical physical set. Yeah, the, and and there's actually in in DC you have, they actually pay for the feed for the White House. There's a hop, a, you know, kind of a vertical feed that's up above, and everyone pays for the same feed. It's, you'll see if they all come in at the same time, it's very odd. Um, the uh, yeah, we did this. Um, here's here's an example of. Uh, of one that we did that was a, a little bit similar to this. This was in the EU and and uh, basically what we had is a bunch of YouTubers and those are four monitors. And again, it's a matter of putting those pieces in. Now what we did is we actually could rotate those side pieces as well so that it kind of felt like the YouTube artist that was there. Um, and so, uh, you know, we were able to swap out, you know, one's coming from Germany, another one's coming from Paris and we were able to change those windows and change actually their, their set. Uh, those those side pieces run rollers. And so, um, you know, that was one kind of version of that. Um, you can definitely do it. I don't know if you really need a lot of the lighting uh, effects there to to make it to make it work. Um, I felt like when I saw the demo of it, the something, something wrong with the white the white points in that in that show. And I don't know whether that was something that he did or whether it was something that was a nature of it, but the stuff that was behind him just didn't feel like it ever got to white. Um, and so I think that was the only thing that that I kept on noticing looking at that video. Uh, next question. Next one comes from Hasma Kajar in Cape Town, South Africa on three Mac minis, one Intel and two M1. Loopback cannot pick up Zoom as a monitor. In audio MIDI setup on the OS, Zoom audio device is listed where Loopback picks up Zoom and not listed on the other Mac. What gives Intel or M1 not a factor? You know, I'm trying to investigate this. Uh, I ran a Zoom update or uh, by accident um, before a show a couple weeks ago and uh, zo and loop loopback stopped working. Like, and it wasn't loopback, it was the ACE underlying hardware was broken by the Zoom update. Um, and I haven't been able to get loopback to work again on that computer <laughs> since. <laughs> so, so anyway, so I haven't run any more updates. But it, it appears that there was some update and it. I got a warning, you may have, click through it, but I got a warning that the ACE uh, from Loopback, that the ACE software wasn't working now. And I haven't been able to get Loopback to work on that computer again. So, I, um, so I'm so i investigating it, but the, we think that there's something going on with the Zoom update a couple weeks ago and the stability of ACE, which is, is what Loopback sits on top of. Uh, next question. Uh, De Fuxak Dorari in uh, Dharamshala says, we want to have feeds from three cameras, 300 meters to our studio, ATEM SDI Pro ISO in our campus. Can the panel suggest an optical fiber to SDI bi-directional converter? Thanks. Yeah, in the past, so what you want to... In what we've done in the past in, in this area is I believe that Blackmagic actually makes some fiber converters that you can use here. These are these are two-way fiber converters. They're little boxes. They're not the, the throwdowns, but they're one-third rack size. And so you're looking for those fiber converters, and I believe they make an SDI version of those that will do bidirectional on those. Um, and so it'll take LC, I believe it's LC in, and then it will be bidirectional on the SDI. So look for those. If not, what we've done in the past is we run, you know, when we run fiber, generally when I buy fiber, I buy, I buy TAC 12, um, 12, because you can, you can afford to break a couple and still have it work. Um, usually you don't need that many, but for me, I run TAC 12 out. So that would take all of your IO out there. Now, what I do is I run two of those in two different routes, you know, to a location. It depends on how much resiliency you need. Um, so I can take all of my signal on either one of those just in case something runs over it. Um, I've had a lot of fiber run over. So, um, so anyway, on the other end, now you're just converting back to SDI. So you have SDI sends, you have SDI receives. Um, so you're not using one piece of fiber. You're using, you have 12 strands in that. But if the, the cost differential between 
TAC 4 and TAC 12 is so small that usually it's worth just going ahead and getting TAC 12. Um, so, so think about that. Um, and then that's gonna give you a lot of IO back and forth. And now you can just put SDI converters on either end and you just send out the way you would send out. Remember that if you're sending control out to those cameras, you only have to send one out um, because it puts all the, all the controls for all the cameras onto one SDI output. And it's just simply in the bank data and it just goes, you know, this is an instruction for camera one, camera two, camera three. So you define those cameras on the far end and then you have them defined on your switcher. So only one return can go out down the fiber and then you simply just need to split it out from there so you put it into a decimator you put it into a um you know typically a one to six uh distro amp something like that on the far end so you don't have to send three returns to get um to control three cameras you can send one return and then split it on the far end to get to all the cameras that you need next question Hasma Gujar in cape town south africa for medical productions in june he wants to use two uh shocks shocks open run as in-ear monitors but can only connect one shocks bluetooth to host computer routing and loopback for two panelists how can i get two open runs as in-ear monitors i go ahead, jeff yeah there's a, a couple things you can do that the easiest thing and, and it's similar to uh how i do something similar and uh, i'm sharing my screen this um you can first put a, a headphone or audio splitter something like this on that computer so you're taking the audio out from that and then you can connect uh, a bluetooth transmitter receiver or your, i assume you only need the transmitter piece um now you can either get separate ones for each of those outputs on the headphone splitter and there might be i don't know if anyone knows you know conceivably there are bluetooth uh, external transmitter receivers you know many of them can support multiple headphones but i don't know if any of them support concurrent you know it's they remember the pairings you can connect multiple there may be just one of these that connects uh that can support the two otherwise just and there's less expensive versions of each of these so you just hang one of these off of each of the ports and each one will support um one of the headphones i'm sorry um <laughs> stuck in the wrong page here hold on um uh we got a lot of questions still going Mark. and by the way the caveat of course is this is not discrete mm -hmm. i am um, this is everyone getting the same audio yep go ahead marty yeah so currently bluetooth is a one-to-one -one, uh connection um if there's no return audio if there's no microphone occasionally you'll find a bluetooth radio that can support two pairs of headsets for listen only but um one of one option might be to get uh, a, a Bluetooth dongle, which would be a second Bluetooth radio that you can plug into the computer, and that will support a second headset. I wouldn't use Bluetooth for this. <laughs> in ear, in ear matters too much, and and I, I think you're 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 in a situation where you're going to start trying to cobble something together. Um, the open the uh, these are bone conduction. You'll hear them in the mics. Um, if they get turned up too much, um, that you're, you're going to be struggling with with op with Bluetooth. Um, this is a recipe for disaster. <laughs> I'm just letting you know, like this is not going to work well. Um, so I would I would really look at proper uh, in ear monitors if I was running an event. Um, next question. Next one comes to us from Alexander Knight in Vancouver, British Columbia. How does an in and out point differ from a video in and out point in DaVinci Resolve? I think the in and out, I believe that what you're talking about without Resolve being open is there's an in and out point for a clip and then there's video in and output in the export uh, area. So when you're actually doing the render out, um, there's a video in and out and that's setting the entire project's in and out render point. And then there's an in and out for the clips. And so I think that I think that those, are, I believe that that's what you're referring to, and that's the distinction between the two. Uh, next question. Tyler Oranger, uh, what's in Chicago? What software and or virtual routing is needed to process the audio on individual Zoom ISO participants, specifically compression and EQ? Um, so we're we're exporting these out and we're starting to work on these on a regular basis, but we don't have it. We're not using it every day, all day, but we are moving towards this. And this is a Dante output. I mean, you can use a couple different things, but you can do um, Dante output to an X32 via to a Dante card. And then we can add all those com that compression and EQ. If you're on the Mac, 
Um, one of the things we're using is SoundDesk by Loud Lab. And so you can use, um, you can use, they have their own routing software or you can use loop, Loopback if it works. Um, and, uh, and then you can route all of those out to SoundDesk and apply EQ, compression, so on and so forth, and then even mix it down to stereo and then send it out from there. So those are, those are a couple different options. I don't have a PC version of that in my head, but um, those are some options there for the, for the Mac and for hardware. Next question. Brad Woodall in Boston, Massachusetts. The guests from Germany who were just on listed off several products I missed the name of. Can you please list them off? We primarily talked in that case about Universe and Isadora. So those are the two. Universe is building an appliance. I don't know if they have a name for it yet. And then Isadora, the the uh, Zoom solution is called IzzyCast. And so that's those are the those are the big things that we talked about there. Next question. Greg Scott, Vancouver, Canada. What's the latest expected drop date for the Office Hours app? And will we be able to choose audio only for replays? Um, yeah, so the it should be May. It's it's a license. I, I just have to set up the, the account properly to have it go out. So it's 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 working fine. Um, and so uh, so it should go out in May. The the uh, there won't be any replays in it. It's just that listen to the show live and be able to get to Makana easily. And I use it every day. <laughs> so it should it should work well. Next question. Andy Kokendorfer in Vieira, Florida. Were there new interesting Dante technologies or devices released at either NAM or NAB? Uh, go ahead, Jeffrey. I saw three boards at uh, NAM, and uh, they were they were great. The uh, first one was the Tascam, it was the Tascam Sonic View. It was a, uh, they have a sixteen channel, they have a twenty four channel, but uh, with the breakout boxes that they're uh, that they're planning to have, they can do a full sixty four by sixty four for Dante, which is great. Yamaha had the DM3. That's only a 16 by 16 Dante, but it's uh, perfect for uh, small productions or uh, bands or anything like that. And then Allen and Heath had their Adventus uh, a lineup that I saw that where they can do up to 128 uh, Dante channels by 128 by 128. Uh, next question. Next question. Douglas Carmichael says, Apple will be introducing app sideloading in iOS and iPad OS 17, but it will most likely only be available in Europe to comply with the EU Digital Markets Act. Do you think sideloading on OS, iOS or iPad OS will come to the USA? It might. Uh, and just like with Android, no one will use it. Uh, next question. <laughs> okay. Uh, moving to Douglas Carmichael in a NASA article about acoustic tests for the Orion capsule. One quote was, quote, the sound we subjected Orion to was louder than a stadium rock concert in larger venues, particularly theaters, arenas, and stadiums. How do you make sure the sound goes where you want? I'll go ahead, Courtney. Well, they test those things in anechoic chambers or in uh, not vacuum chambers, but in airfield chambers because the sound of the, the launch uh, – can resonate, uh, the booster can resonate and shake stuff apart. So that's how they control where the sound goes. It's in a special chamber for NASA. And in rock stadiums, they have uh, line arrays of drivers to point the sound in the right direction, make sure it all arrives coherently to the audience as best it can. Next question. Next question comes to us from Jack Rupel in Breckenridge, Colorado. Anybody connecting object-based audio metadata with motion tracking metadata in an Apple Metal application to help realize the full potential of vi virtual reality? Could inner ear problems be remedied? Excellent audio can be the most important part of a good video. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know a lot of people that are using it yet, but this is we, we're already seeing this in game content um, that that where they're adding objects and the objects are then able to do it. I think you're going to see a lot of this coming forward. So um, you're going to see a, a lot of interest in immersive audio as it as it relates to games, and it really does make a difference. It changes the gameplay actually because you can hear things coming from behind um, and and over and so on and so forth. So so I do think you're going to see a lot more of this. I don't know a lot of people that are doing it in the Apple tools at the moment, but but they are doing it. There's uh, tools in Unreal and Unity that are already already making this available for games. Uh, next question. Kyle Hammond in Chicago, Illinois. What are the preferred companies for quick print QR code business cards like what was used for Office Hours NAB? Uh, I use QR Factory on the Mac. Um, and so I won't use any online tools to do that because a lot of times they might insert a different URL. I want a piece of software <laughs> that generates it. Um, and then uh, and then I used, um, I think it was Fast Print or something like that. It's near our office. Um, and so they, and they um, or Minute, Minute Man, I think, or Minute 
print or something was what what we used for for uh, you know it was done in uh, the same day. <laughs> so so that was uh, and and so um that's what that's why I used it for um, for NAB. Next question. Claudia Lopez Waterman in Salisbury, Maryland. I can't quite get enough mic gain on my Shox headset. Is there a possibly a setting I'm missing? Go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, if you have the open com like I do, where you have the microphone right here, then getting it close to your mouth is is the most. I don't think there's any other setting other than uh, possibly bringing it into a, a piece of software and, and uh, boosting it that way. Yeah, I think that you're having some kind of, I, you were in a meeting yesterday and you, it was really low and it seemed to go in and out. And I think that there's a noise cancellation. I think where you are is a pretty noisy place and the noise cancellation is getting somehow confused. Um, uh, that's what it felt like. It felt like it was fully, it was fully there and then fully not. And it may be also potentially, I know this will sound crazy, but turning off, turning on original sound what, with what you're jumping in with. It may actually be Zoom doing that, if, if you're, unless you're hearing it with everything that you're doing. But it felt like it was going in and out um, yesterday. Uh, next question. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas. Where does space program stand globally with the next Starship launch being scheduled in two months? What countries and companies stand out and where do you learn more about space? Uh, real quick, John. SpaceX is killing everybody. The sites that I have, uh, Space Now, Space.com, Everyday Astronaut. Japanese company yesterday tried to land a rover on the moon and they failed. Space is hard. They succeeded in in finding a way not to do it. <laughs> you got to look at the bright side. <laughs> Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, what John said. I, I recommend all those things, <laughs> those same uh, website. <laughs> Next question. Douglas Carmichael, Apple AirPods Pro earbuds have active noise cancellation functionally that can reduce loud environmental sounds. Has anyone had experience with it and how well do they fit? Uh, go ahead, Jeff. Uh, fit, um, that depends on each person. I have uh, one ear that is, uh, I swear, Apple certified. I mean, it works the way intended. I can sleep in AirPods and they stay in. The other, I mean, they can't eat. If I take a breath, they fall out of the other ear. So that's fit. And and then that leads to noise. You know, uh, weeks back, we, you know, we talked about IEMs and the real custom mold fit. Um, and how critical that is. I mean, but he even talked about how deep into the ear canal it has to go to truly reduce the sound coming into your ear. So noise reduction is, is going to change what's coming into your ear. But unless you have true isolation, you're still getting a lot of sound in. I find that putting um, putting the AirPods in and then putting um, the the kind of headphones you'd have when you're like bringing aircraft in, they, they have these isolation ones on top of that, works great. <laughs> I've done it's that the, with uh, gun range headphones. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah, or, yeah the, the cheap ones actually, the cheap gun range ones are better because the, the other ones are designed to let some sound through. So the cheaper ones are, are better for that. <laughs> All right, we are changing subjects and talking about brainstorming for audio. And it's popular. We have a lot of suggestions already. Uh, of course, we'll start with um, any, any of the ideas or things that the panelists are, are want to talk about before we jump into all the, all the uh, producer requirements. If, if, you, if, if, uh, if the panelists have anything to add. Now, I, you know, I do think that, you know, one of the things we're really is to, to kind of remind people, we talked about it a little bit in the beginning of the hour, you know, really trying to, you know, build more specialties into this process. And so, uh, so we, basically we have Mondays are more business oriented, Tuesdays are graphics, Wednesdays are audio, that's today, uh, Thursdays are video, Fridays are more logistical, and Saturdays are education, and Sunday is usually kind of our day off <laughs> when we talk about things. Um, and so... Uh, those are the those are the, the subject matters, and our goal is to really try to dig through basics. Um, one of the things we're trying to structure is every month you're going to see us talking about a, a basic thing. Every month you'll have a, at least one vendor come in and talk about what they do. Um, every month we, we'd like to try to interview someone every month um, to you know talk about how they do their work. We had um, and, and uh, uh, we had Cheryl on from Hot House, you know, that, you know, Hot House, um, that, that was, uh, that was great. And she's going to come back again <laughs> because we didn't, we, we didn't get enough <laughs> of, 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 uh, then it was funny. I was, um, I was talking about that with somebody at, at a company that does a lot of surround at NAB and there. And I was like, yeah, we had someone come on and they're like, Cheryl, you had Cheryl on. We saw it. <laughs> So, so it was like, yeah, like we all, we all, we all, we all love Cheryl. <laughs> so, so anyway, so it was a, <laughs> so it was a funny, it was a funny conversation. And so, um, anyway, we're going to hopefully to bring, uh, you know, kind of break it up and move into those. So, so if there are people 
if there's vendors, if there's basics, if there's general subjects that you want us to cover, uh, go ahead and throw those uh, suggestions into Mokana. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Jeff. Yeah, one of the things I and I put a, a question in so we can take that out. But, um, you know, I would think it'd be really cool if we did some live uh, AB or, or bracket style March Madness bracket style competitions or, or reviews discussions on th- audio things like noise reduction software plugins. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, it would take a little bit of work up front to kind of prepare uh, audio samples and clips, you know, which obviously people can volunteer and take on. Um, But, you know, every time, and what gave me the idea, you know, I was reading reviews of, let's say, as new and new, um, even quote unquote, AI based noise reduction, like clarity and things like that. You can read the reviews, but I haven't seen anyone do something that we could do uh, where we could, you know, play an A, B and and even really do some cool uh, bracket style review and discussion. I haven't seen that discussion live where the audience can hear the difference again, pre-produced, you know, here's how this noise reduction sounds. Here's how this one sounds. Which do you like? And, And move down, of course, we could do some really cool bracket graphics, you know, it's sky's the limit. And I haven't seen anyone do that. Uh, One other thing I'll I'll just throw in real quick, you know, um, while those of us are, that are doing voiceover, you know, before we're quickly replaced with the AI, you know, it'd be cool to focus a little bit more (laughs) on on voiceover, you know, while we still have a job. (laughs) Dark. Um, Yeah, yeah, I know, I think, I think that we, they're still there. We're still there, we'll be there for a little while. Um, Yeah, go ahead, Marty. Yeah, so audio is like so pervasive through so many areas of of media production, whether it be, we talk here a lot about uh, audio for webcasting and broadcasting. Um, We get a lot of questions about live sound and loudspeakers and directionality and stuff like that. But, and, and we've been, um, we've been kind of Booking our, our 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 Wednesdays around three three areas as as you mentioned. There's the technical topics, there's uh, uh, products, and then there are people. Um, and I, I'm really interested to see what our audience, what the producers um, would like us to to do more of in the future. Um, uh, live sound is a very very uh, broad topic uh, about, you know, t- how do you tune speakers for a room? What speakers do you select to use for a room? Um, you know, whether it's point source or line array or something else, um, that's a huge area that we don't talk about too much here. And, and I'm interested to see if, if our audience uh, is, is more interested in that. It's great. Um, so we're going to jump into the, uh, the, the producer, uh, uh, suggestions, um, rem- a reminder to the panelists, we're not trying to answer any of these questions directly. We are just building on what we would do if we were going to cover that for a second hour. Now let's go ahead and jump into the into the suggestions. Alex Scott, uh, Alan Scott, excuse me, Fredericton, New Brunswick, Canada says, how to record big things in big spaces like a pipe organ of a cathedral. Now go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, that'd be an interesting topic and we could fold into that maybe binaural recording as a possible yeah. way of doing a uh, ambient recordings like that, or whether to go multi mic or binaural, et cetera, yeah, types even, of mics and placement, et cetera. And one of the things that I think um, that that this could kind of build on is also impulse recording. You know, where you're recording either a sweep or you're recording, um, you know, popping a balloon or 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 doing other things that are going to, to measure to tune your tune your. Uh, to, to, to measure the reverberance, or, or you know that that is there um, to match it. One of the things I was listening to something in NPR years ago, and they talked about the fact that a lot of the chants um, that that were created were created for a specific cathedral, and that the that they the the speed at which they were designed it sounds it sounds interesting now, but it was really designed to be sound to sound like heaven, you know, to have things bouncing around, and and so that the the speed at which they did that was so that the voices would start to fill up the entire um, cathedral, but it was different for every cathedral. (laughs) And we just listened to them as recordings in a studio. And when they added that back in, it sounded pretty amazing. But they went to the the cathedrals and they actually took where that chant came from and got impulses. I think that'd be a really interesting conversation. Go ahead, Jeffrey. 
Yeah, and uh, on that aspect, of course, we can have any type of microphone uh, company come in and talk about it. But uh, while I was at NAM, I saw a company called Zylia, Z-Y-L-I-A, did an interview with them. They're doing spatial microphone with placement on stage. Like, for instance, if you have an orchestra, mm-hmm. they'll have several mics on stage. So you can actually direct yourself. You can uh, wear a pair of head, uh, VR headsets and then point to that uh, that one chair, and then you can get the sound from that area. That would be a great uh, guest. I can definitely share the contact so we can get them on the show. That'd be great, Jeff. And since we're brainstorming, I mean, again, I think this is a great opportunity, something like this, not not a shootout, but, you know, we often show visual examples here. Again, I think this is a great opportunity to play examples from folks that have done it. Here's maybe how not to do it, or if you do this, here's how it's going to sound. And then if you do it correctly, here's how it's going to sound, especially as we get into 5.1 and and spatial audio on the fee. We really, I think, have some cool opportunities to to demonstrate this to everyone. Yeah, 100%. Go ahead, Marty. Um, yeah, I would say this is uh, would fall under the category of environmental audio and, and how to record uh, the sound of environments, um, whether that be and so a, a pipe organ in a cathedral is is a really good example. Uh, if you're recording that for stereo, I would do it one way. If I were recording it for multi-channel surround sound, I would do it a different way. The um, uh, information about multi-mic arrays, you know, what microphones to use, how to put them, how to position them, how far apart, depending on where you, you know, um, what channels you're, you're going to be, or, or the environment you're going to actually be playing them in makes a, makes a, a difference. Um, but I, I just wanted to add something to what uh, you were saying, Alex, about um, uh, chants and cathedrals and that being specific. Not only was it specific for the, for the cathedral, uh, these pieces were written for specific cathedrals, but they were written be, uh, in such a way and performed in such a way that the the clerics and the ministers and other officiants were sitting in particular places in particular cathedrals, and they were performed so that they would sound correct in each of those places rather than yeah. generally throughout. The, it's fascinating. It'd be it'd be a fun it'd be a fun subject. Maybe we reach out to those folks and 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 pull that in. I, if for some reason this one opened up a lot of things about recording, you know, we could also have a, a whole second hour and just recording a band. You know, like how do you uh, mic the drum set and the and how do you get all the feeds? And and I know that um, uh, you know there's a lot of uh, Jeremy Horn here who we work with a lot um, here has all the tools to do that. <laughs> so, so, so we could potentially, you know, get into a space and, and talk about, you know, miking a band. And then there's a whole nother section there that got me thinking about, well, if we're miking the band, how do we manage in-ear monitors for all the bands? You know, just like, what is that mix? What is that return mix? And how do you customize it for every person? I know that's, I'm building from what, what we're doing, but those are some other subjects we could probably um, dive into. And then in general, just recording. I mean, there's big things, but there's also just recording little things like the, that Sanken C100. I, I so want to, I want to buy one. I just have no reason to, <laughs> like, I just look at it going, I need an excuse to get a hundred, you know, uh, you know, a hundred K sound, but I, yeah, we'll, we'll still, we'll, we'll, maybe we'll bring somebody on from Sanken and they'll show us how that works. Next question. Andy Kokendorfer in VR Florida says, were there any new interesting desktop mic preamps and or USB interfaces at NAM or NAB this year? Go ahead, Bill. The most interesting thing to me, I was shocked. Our own George Whittem, who's been on the show before, and Centris got together and made a specific bespoke mixer for the voiceover industry. It's a thing called the Passport VO. And it's interesting in that it has things like mix minus and fold back built into it. It is a small batch creation. They're only going to sell, a th- I think, a hundred of these. It's pretty expensive. It's around $650. But to me, that was something I had never seen before. We're making a product for a niche. We're going to charge a lot for it, and we're going to see if this works. If it does, that may mean that more specialized tools come out for individual industries rather than just a generic product that everyone has to make work as best they can. I was fascinated by that. I would love to have George on. I mean, just as we're talking about these, I would love to bring George on and have him talk through the whole thing and the thought I'm process. I'm sure he'd be happy it, to. Yeah, so we, we should definitely. George, if you're listening, number one is why are you not here? It's, it's audio day. <laughs> yeah, but 
<laughs> but, but otherwise, it would be great to have George come on and, and talk about it. And it'd be, so we'll, we'll, we'll work on that. Jeffrey? I did a video on this and the audio just died on my camera rig. But Neumann, of course, they have their new audio interface. It's the uh, MT48. Uh, I think it got best to show at one of either NAB or NAM, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's one that we could probably get on to. to yeah. Absolutely, I think that that they bought that company. They bought a company and then uh, kind of rebuilt that that system there, Jeff. Yeah, and with that one, I don't know if they bought it or, or partnered with them, but it's. Mm -hmm. But it's, uh, it but I think that company like is now owned by Neumann or, or the, or, you know, so, so they're, they're right. it's, it's a subsidiary at this point. So, right. I'm not sure. And I think, they, go ahead. Um, Bill's, Bill's point is great about something like what, what George did. It's they, after years and years of hearing all the problems and dealing with trying to fix all the problems, this, you know, the voiceover industry had, yeah. uh, folks that are not techie, they just want to sit down in front of the mic and record. And they built this and, uh, almost like in a Kickstarter model, like Bill said, you know, they're going to see if, if the demand is there and if this solves it, but very specialized in Tended to get rid of all the issues that they've identified happen again and again. Yeah, and and uh, you know I think Rode came out with another one that's kind of single source, single source with a single uh, HDMI, and that might be another one that's interesting to you know bring Rode, someone from Rode on to talk about it or have you know I, I'd like to get to a point where we just have folks send us some hardware and then someone here his job is to work on it and and figure it out and then and then come on and talk about it when we can't get because Rode is hard because they're in Australia. <laughs> so they're uh, so that, that it'll be harder to get them. I think we find that New Zealand and Australia is, is a challenge to bring the experts on unless they have a U.S. expert to talk to. Um, so they might be able to send us some gear and we'll we'll test it. Uh, next question. Next one comes to us from Greg Scott in Vancouver, B.C. Latency free audio or video conferencing platforms for groups of remotely located singers. Go ahead, Courtney. We did a second hour on this on Farplay. What we might do is uh, pick up, go back to those people and, and do their one-year anniversary. And I know there's a new version, seven, a 1.0.7, I think, that came out. Mm -hmm. And maybe catch up with them and see what's improved and what's up with uh, the Farplay app. Any That'd excuse cool. to get Dan Tepper back on Dan, and, yeah. and, and, the, and and his friends and and uh, Todd and everything else is, is worth it. <laughs> so 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 it's uh, so I, uh, any excuse we can do that to bring him on would be great. Uh, Jeffrey? Yeah, and uh, on that same line, Elk Audio, uh, yeah. they came out with the Elk Audio OS, which is a, a board. I'm not exactly sure how it works just yet, but uh, bringing them in to talk about latency and, and performing. Yeah, and we had Elk on years ago. Like it, when they were just getting started, it was we had a second hour, but they were kind of piecing it all together. It's come a long way over the, I think, I think it might have been almost two years since we've had Elk Audio on. So having them come on and give us an update of what they're doing, I think would be would be great. Next question. Marty Adius, Marilyn here in the panel. Sound for live conference and music events. Do you have anything specific, Marty, or just in general, we should be covering more of that? Yeah, well, like I was saying earlier, the the whole area of live audio and, and loudspeakers and venues uh, is is something that uh, is a huge market. It's a whole different set of people that do that versus people who do recording and it might be a way to expand our audience actually you know yeah our market yeah absolutely yeah so i i think that uh i think that makes a lot of sense and and there are many things whether it's wireless for a large event um there is loudspeakers for a large event general miking for a large you know uh a large event like this uh, in conferences um you know, we talked a little bit about we've had um a little bit of discussion about frequency uh, management, but but all of those things are things that I think would make a lot of sense. Next question. Tlaloc Lopez Waterman, Salisbury, Maryland. Let's go deep on gain staging. Now go ahead, Bill. Yeah, I like the idea of spending more time because people who are starting out, it's one of the things they get wrong really uh, consistently. The other thing is just audio workflow. I've seen more and more complexity built into these particularly desktop audio systems. And if you don't have a good idea of what should go first, second, and third in a chain, and and some sense of how will it affect differently if you put compression here versus two stages down the road. That's well worth talking about, I think. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, gain staging is is a pretty simple, and B can be complex if you're trying to find out where that distortion is coming from. So uh, you know, we could do that. And troubleshooting uh, related to gain staging would also be good. You know, figure out where the distortion is creeping in at what stage in the gain. Yeah, Jeffrey. 
And I always get confused on, on mixing boards nowadays because gain staging can be so much different. You have the regular gain stage, you have the digital gain stage, and then you group the you group uh, guitars, you group uh, drums and things like that, and that can mess everything up. So we could bring in a couple uh, mixing companies to uh, talk about how they deal with gain stage on their boards. You good, Marty? Yeah, and the other aspect of gain staging, well, one of them is distortion, as Bill was saying, but the other one is noise. If you do it wrong, you get more noise in the system. Yeah, and and you know we we had a lot of noise. I we were at a pretty big hotel in Vegas years ago, and I have I the one thing I I tend to do is have really high end audio engineers <laughs> you work on my product because that the audio is the biggest thing and it's the hardest thing to do. And I remember talking to my audio engineer, and it wasn't wasn't Brian, but it was another one of the three or four that I use for for larger events. And I and the wireless was supplied. He was the owner of the hotel. And they're wireless. They're the only ones who do audio mics when he's in the room. And it was really noisy. And I just said, I need you to go over there and fix that gain stage. And uh, he went over and 15 minutes later, everything was perfectly clear. <laughs> you know, like it was, and it wasn't, so I think that the gain staging is really important because it's, um, it was, it was instant and it was, it wasn't complicated, but it wasn't being done, you know? And I think that, uh, and I think that talking through what it takes to do that uh, would be really important. Now, next question. Dave Troutman in Edmonton, Canada. A look at microphone polar patterns, frequency response curves, and sensitivity ratings. I think that'd be great. You know, really understanding how mics work in those response patterns uh, would be would be really cool. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, and related to that, which microphones with what type of polar patterns are used in which type of situations as far as interiors versus exteriors and how to, you know, for dialogue versus instrument miking and so on. Yeah, how they're absolutely. Related. Yeah, go ahead, Marty. Yeah, most people think of uh, microphone polar patterns as from what direction will this microphone pick up? But the other part of that is what direction will the from what direction will this microphone reject sound? Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah, go Jeff. And I think in conjunction with that, e even you know, looking back at the question about okay, where do I put my mic in a square room? Um, you know, even the difference of the different types. You know, how would a dynamic mic work, or even what is the difference between just a dynamic mic versus a condenser mic, and 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 then on top of that, the polar patterns. Yeah, good, Bill. And uh, the frequency versus pickup patterns, you know, it might be directional at mids and highs, but it's still going to pick up low end. And that's why the boombox car going by outside is just gets everywhere and you can't get rid of it. Yeah. In my copious free time on the weekend, I've been playing with this idea of building 3D models of those polar patterns, which I'm pretty close to uh, making it relatively simple to do using uh, subdivision surfaces within Cinema 4D. And um, and so it'd be fun to have these as because my thought is, is we what would be really cool. I don't know how to do it yet, so I was like, well, I'll just figure out the modeling right now. But to have an AR app that you could point at a mic and it would just show you the polar pattern, like it would just like you just walk around it and it would just show you what the polar pattern is. Just it would just track to it and and just show you this is what this is how it's going to work. Um, I think we're not that far away from that. So I, um, but, I have to unmute just to say, wow. Yeah, so so that would be be useful. Anyway, so um, so we'll uh, I, I, again, it's just me fiddling at the moment, but we'll we'll see. Um, next question, Jack Rupel, Breckenridge, Colorado, Da Vinci Fairlight Second Hour Fusion Second Hour with free and paid workflow limitation capabilities highlighted. Yeah, yeah, we're definitely gonna we definitely need to bring somebody on to talk about Fairlight for audio and then Fusion for the graphics, um, the graphics day, and uh, we'll we're working on getting folks into to do that um, in the next uh, couple months. Uh, next question. Tlala Lopez Waterman in Salisbury, Maryland. Dante, gotchas, pros and cons. I think we can get the folks from Audinate to come on and, and talk to us a little bit about this. I mean, they, they do a lot of these courses and what I think would be really fun is to have kind of a mini course of, of introducing it to us with the, you know, that's not too far away from one of their next online courses so that, you know, we kind of know what, uh, it, it, these are really good courses and, and having them come on and talk about it would be great. So we'll, we'll take a look at that. Next question. Kyle Hammond in Chicago. And I'm not quite sure how to read this radio play. I think it's maybe radio plays to research sounds in different spaces, or it might be radio plays to research. Sound. I don't know. Good, good, Courtney. Yeah. I don't know if this would be to research sounds in different places because most radio plays were done during the 30s and 40s. Some are still done concurrently, but they're all close mic'd with a sound effects guy that's off to the side creating the ambience and the sound effects needed and are all mixed in individually. So 
usually it's done in a in a very silent studio. I uh, I so want to do a radio play, and and uh, Leo and I have talked about it. Like we really want to do radio plays, and and so it'd be fun to find a space to do them, and then show behind the scenes of us doing them, and then answer questions and so on. But it's they're so much fun to do, and and we we did one in our office um, years ago in the Big Score office. There was just a, some of our employees were into radio plays, and so they. They put them together and, and did them, and it was just amazing. Go ahead, Marty. Yeah, radio plays are actually very popular right now. Um, they're coming back, and there are whole groups of people who are um, writing and, and performing radio plays. Uh, there's, a, In fact, there's even a festival uh, for it uh, once a year. Um, so, and, and I think what, he, what the question is about is how do you create ambience Right. Uh, to to put the actors in uh, in a space, I think that's yeah that, that might be a good topic. And this is some of the stuff that I I think that um, it'd be really interesting because I know that uh, Cheryl's doing a lot of of the Atmos you know style podcasts, and I think that creating atmosphere is going to be something that uh, you know so you know with with what Odd House is doing, I think that the, what they're doing for Wonder is it Wonderly? I think it's Wonderly that they're building these, and I think that figuring out how to build those would be would be really interesting. Go ahead, Jeffrey. And I'm just going to throw this out here because we were talking about audiobooks, so we could actually turn the audiobook into a radio play if, if and when we start doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, next question. Lalek Lopez Waterman, Salisbury, Maryland. AV sink, sink, sink. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, get bringing on, I'm um, talking about that process, and I, I think that there's probably two hours there. One hour that is talking about what AV sync is, why it occurs. And some more kind of basic ways of of solving it, and then um, you know we probably want to bring in uh, folks that are building the tools to to make that happen. So Hitomi uh, Matchbox is the one that most people use at this point, yeah, you know, for for that. So bringing those guys on would be would probably be useful. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, Simpty and a lot of audio uh, manufacturers and network networking manufacturers been working on this for years. So. Uh, more than an hour is not going to solve that problem. They still haven't gotten it nailed down yeah. completely. I mean, there's there's definitely ways that we get really close fast. And then there is, um, again, the Matchbox is what used to be called Validate. And a Validate system is something that we saw in every truck. Like every truck, every master control, every everything had this, this one box that would allow you to kind of uh, confirm sync between units. Um, and then the team that built Validate became Hitomi, and they built the Matchbox, which is like the next generation of that. And so I think it'd be good to, and they keep on getting better. They have an iPad app. So, you know, if we had it, I'm trying to save up. It's expensive. It's, I don't know, 11000 or $13,000 or something. So we don't have one, but it would be something that literally the panelists here could pick up an iPad and point it at the camera and have their mic pick it up and it would tell, it just tells us, oh, that they're off by 168 milliseconds or whatever that is. Um, and we can make that correction. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. I think the other side of that, though, is interesting also, you know, what, what Bill has gone through and could probably, you know, do a whole hour on is diagnosing why it's happening in the first place when mm -hmm. you're getting out of sync and, and what ended up being the culprit, you know, who would have thunk it? So mm -hmm. I think diagnosing, you know, when there's a, a real uh, sync mm -hmm. problem, diagnosing it versus just then trying to right. correct it or force it. Hey, go ahead, Courtney. And the differences between offset and drift, because they're two different things. It can be offset because it's being delayed mm -hmm. by something, but it's a consistent delay. And then there's a disagreement between sample rates, which can cause drift. So it's a constantly moving offset, which is much harder to diagnose. Yeah, and I think that uh, one of the things that we could talk about is also how we're managing that in a central location. And, you know, and this can be as we move forward with the the isolated audio, because as we move to isolated audio, as an example. We actually want to have all the all the ho the the hosts or all the panelists stop doing any um, delay. So once we have it sorted out on our end, we don't want them to do delay. That way, our conversation is more fluid because if we're delaying our audio, it's delay. If we're delaying our audio by 160 milliseconds, then our communication is delayed by 160 milliseconds on top of Zoom's delay. So we want to figure out how to let the panelists just have the lowest latency they can have, and then on the back end, we're sub correcting all of that you know, for them. And so that's, um, that's a whole nother thing that is probably worth a second hour.
Uh, next, next question. Next suggestion. Jack Rupel, Breckenridge, Colorado, says 32-bit float, a second hour, a hardware, time code, and software, uh, hardware, time code, software, and deliverables. I go ahead, Courtney. And that's good because I've written a lot of time code related uh, software. So uh, I can speak on that subject pretty authoritatively. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, next, next suggestion. Uh, Douglas Carmichael, predictive modeling software like Lacoustics Sound Division, and he's got a link there for it. Yeah, I mean, I think getting Alacoustics on in general would be useful. Um, using, um, I think we're, we used the, for the five one, I believe we used Alisa, um, which was the software to um, do some of the, some of the five one work that we did um, over uh, yeah, last week. So, uh, I think having them on, or even us just showing how we're using it, would be useful. Uh, next, next uh, suggestion. John Snyder, Reno, Nevada, has this one: background and or intro music for content creation. How to select, create it, when to use it, and so forth. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, that's a great idea, especially uh, uh, separating uh, YouTube versus what you would do for a TV show. Maybe you even have somebody like Soundblocks or uh, Pond5 or Epidemic Sound uh, come on, because Epidemic Sound also gives you not only the full mix, but also each individual stem, so you can redo what you need to do for a different background sounds. I've done that a lot. So uh, I would I would uh, be for uh, yeah. ha having one of those groups on. Yeah, good, good Courtney. Yeah, or AI or transformer created background sounds. Uh, so get rid of the copyright problems and uh, can generate something that's appropriate for whatever type of intro or outdoor you're using just by a, a text description, perhaps. Yeah, I think that it would also be interesting just to talk about, I mean, I think that there are, I don't know whether it's a lab or whether it's a second hour, maybe a bit of both, is really people understanding how to build their own little background loop. If you just need a couple loops, going into logic or going into something else and just building something that is you know just has a little bit of something there um you know that that is in the background it's not something that's that hard to do i've done a lot of it <laughs> so i'm not i'm not a musician by any means but i'm i'm pretty useful with loops you know and i can throw these loops in and throw a couple of things in maybe a little bit of midi and and put something together that that sits in the background that that works for a for um you know for a piece of content so i think understanding not how to become a musician, the next, you know, um, but but really how to become someone who can just throw something together relatively quickly that is usable. Um, there's so many loops. Like I, I have, um, you know, this is where I, I actually use FL Studio for it um, because it's um, there's a lot of tools that are built for that that you can buy subsets for. So it might be something. And getting FL Studio on would probably be useful as well. Yeah, go, Jeff. And I think. Um a lot of the subtleties that that people are clearly not thinking about, you know, maybe discussing some of them. I, I hear so many uh, voiceovers, you know, that are adding their own music. They're being asked to add music to their voiceovers. And so selecting it is one thing. I mean, that's very subjective and, and that's between you and, and you know, the, the the client but but just all the subtleties in terms of the levels, where should the levels be and right. what you know, what is the right genre of music and then, you know, timing it. I mean, sometimes there's just very obvious timing mismatches where you're hitting something in the middle of a symbol, you know, and, right. you know, you could have moved that over. So I think those subtleties clearly people aren't thinking about would be great. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. Samuel Nordvik in Norway, a comparison on the most used DAWs, digital audio workstations. I'm especially interested in Reaper. I go, Jeff. Well, Samuel had a great idea that I didn't see because my question uh, is, is essentially the very same thing that I posted only moments later. We can take that out. Uh, yeah, I think that's a great I, I too am a Reaper uh, user extensively, so I think that'd be great. And, you know, and, and I, I call it a state of the DAW because it, it, beyond just comparing them, even more specifically, the updates. In other words, where are they today? You know, we... So, Folks may have done a review of, of DAWs, you know, a couple of years ago. Where are they today? What features have they added? <clears throat> you know, you're seeing more and more of them do a transcription so that you can kind of like descript, you know, you can edit or at least search for audio based on text. And there's a lot of cool features that men we're going to see more and more AI. And even in that discussion, comparing online tools like Descript that for a lot of people can replace a, a local desktop DAW. Hey, go ahead, Courtney. Sorry, and, and um, the difference between uh, 
audio for video and audio for music and or right. radio because of the synchronization issues. Uh, because a lot of Reaper, you know, there's really good DAWs out there that really can't handle the different video rates, et cetera. But, um, right. and some do. Next question. Craig McFarland, Boston, Massachusetts. AV sync measure. I'd like to see a simple way to test and troubleshoot video lag, like using a clip. And he's got a link there to it. Yeah, I, I think that get, getting back to video sync, I think there's there's apps, there's there's uh, there's video files, there's and there's lots of idiosyncrasies, especially when you're trying to get to the frame. Uh, that a lot of times, like a sample video off of YouTube, might be off by a little bit. And so we've that we've found in the past. So uh, that's always a challenge as well. So talking through that would would definitely make sense. Uh, next question, Douglas Carmichael, a deep dive into Bitwig Studio, and he's got the link. Yeah. I mean, if we have, we just need an expert in Bitwig to talk about it. But yeah, 100%. I think it'd be really interesting to see what they do there. Next question. Peter Moore, Auckland, New Zealand. Has anyone here used a vertical line array speaker system to solve sound distribution at an outdoor event? I think bringing someone in that has, I think would be useful. I don't know how many people here have done that, but I think that uh, I think that getting, there are some speaker folks that we've worked with in the past that we might be able to get in to come talk about those things. And in general, talking about speaker arrays and, you know, we, we might be able to get someone in from Meyer to, you know, talk, talk a little bit to it as well. Um, that might be a useful, useful second hour. Now, next question. Douglas Carmichael just says Logic Pro has got the link to it. Yeah. I mean, talking about Logic would be great. Uh, you know, I think that there's, uh, We'll wait. I mean, I think we'll definitely do an introduction to Logic. I think there'll be probably more coverage of Logic as we get into the fall. Uh, next question. Peter Moore in Auckland, New Zealand says, uh, his question is about does the USB connection, USB 2 point something or 3 point something, affect what bit rate and so forth on the audio side of things? And he notes, I know about data transfer, not my question. Yeah, I mean, I think talking about these different formats and how they affect what we do in audio would be useful. Go ahead, Courtney. Yeah, it doesn't affect audio that much at uh, USB connection speeds because, you know, most USB connections can handle almost any kind of audio uh, unless you're talking about, you know, super high frequency, non-audible audio, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Next question. Andy Kokendorfer, Vieira, Florida. I'd like to understand more about Nureva Mic Mist technology, how it works and how to optimize rooms for this tech. Yeah, so this is uh, one of the many solutions for a conference room and how to make sure that, you know, it's a kind of, I believe it's some kind of beam forming um, system where it's calculating the room and figuring out what it can, you know, how to grab onto individual people and, and clarify that as much as possible. Um, and I think that this is a good one to, to bring on, maybe even bringing that company on to talk about how it works. Um, but I think there's a couple different ones. And I think talking about talking about this kind of mic process every three months or six months would probably make sense. So we'll, we'll take a look at that. Um, next question. Tommy Shant, St. Paul, Minnesota, and I'm laughing because of the terminology. I think it would be great to have some setup video specific by and for Office Hours Global. Mix pre setup, mix minus loop back, potato, and so forth. <laughs> No fruits, no fruit. No, we, we, we might include some fruits. Oh, it's a vet, you know, vegetables or fruits. Anyway, so the, uh, I think that, that definitely, um, uh, we can definitely talk about that. I mean, we're going to probably do more labs in those areas, but talking about the basic setup, and we've done that a little bit in when we talk about behind the scenes of our, our setups here. I don't know if we go into it as technically. The second hours usually are there to cover it, and we're still kind of moving quickly through through those things, but we could definitely look at certain pieces of how each person does something um, for their audio. I think that would make sense. Uh, next question. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas. Hearing aids, latest technology, prescription versus off the shelf. Yeah, I think that, uh, that this is going to be a, a market that's growing quickly because it's now opened. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. We could do that and incorporate hearing protection so that you don't lose your hearing in the first place. <laughs> exactly. Uh, next question. Harshid Trevitti here on the panel, Daytona Beach, Florida. What kind of mics are needed for voiceover for audio description? Yeah, I mean, so there's two pieces there. One is audio description, and then the other one is is a dubbing, you know, for, you know, audio interpreters that are inserting those, you know, inserting tracks into it because there's, I just had this long discussion in AB with someone about this. And the tools that are available to the interpreters to do, whether it's audio description or 
or languages are horrible, you know, and so they're, you know, they're just really cheap, you know, they, they're expensive, but cheaply made. <laughs> and so there's a lot of, you know, it's like they didn't really think about things like, you know, circuitry, integrity and noise and gain state, you know, like it's, there's a whole bunch of things that are built in that don't really work. Um, and so I was talking about the need for someone to build and there's some folks working on this, some re a really high end version of a, of a interpreter station um, that is that that could work well, and um, we'll see how that goes. Anyway, good, Courtney. Yeah, since uh, audio descriptions for the sight impaired, we ought to get good at whispering, and they just listen to the last part of office hours, and they know how good audio description should be. <laughs> good, Jeff. Record it. <laughs> Uh, I think really this could be broken out into two parts. I think the the mic conversation can be part of the conversation we talked about just a little while ago. You know, what is the right mic for the different uses when we when we talk about polar patterns and dynamic versus condenser, yeah. and then perhaps a se a separate uh, discussion uh, just about the process because. You know, that is absolutely going to be one of the early targets uh, and very good use for AI, uh, you know, and everything from analyzing objects that are in a video or a photograph and having the AI um, beyond just reading it, you know, actually creating the, the description. There's just, I forget the name, a, a new app that was just released Um uh, by the one of the Instagram co-founders that is a newsreader, but you can tap on any article and it will create through AI a summary uh, or, do, you know, uh, a summary basically of that article. And you can give it different levels of summarize it like I'm a fifth grader. And so in other words, Great. combining things like that uh, could be a very interesting conversation in terms of um, all the capabilities like audio descriptions. Yeah. All right, go ahead, Marty. Yeah, interesting. The FCC has recently expanded the audio description mandate to additional markets, and they expect to grow those that number of markets uh, incrementally over the next few years. So audio description is, is becoming more and more important for broadcast, but it also uh, plays a really big part in movie theater presentation, uh, playhouse theater presentation, uh, and yeah, that, that technology needs to, and the tools that, that are available needs to improve. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's something we can certainly talk about here. Absolutely. Next, next question. Douglas Carmichael, he says, going to space, why not acoustic research systems? And he's got the link to them there, which has leveraged pro audio technology to test satellites. Yeah. I think that'd be great. <laughs> so let's we'll see, we'll see if we can get those guys on to talk through it. It'll be a great second hour. Uh, next question. Uh, Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas says, audio on portals and similar all-in-one devices. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that talking through those would make sense. We just have to figure out if there's someone from engineering that wants to talk about those. A lot of times they're, that getting those to work took an immense amount of testing and uh, a lot of proprietary approaches and software and hardware and so getting people to talk about it will be hard that's the that's the challenge uh, next question douglas carmichael the direct out prodigy modular processing and conversation uh, conversion platform and he's got a link to it yeah we have to um, definitely uh, check that out absolutely no um, next question peter moore auckland new zealand back with can we have a section a session on midi and how we can chain it or not and so forth um on my H and K amp has MIDI in and out, but not through thoughts. I mean, I think in general, I think there's probably, I don't know about that specifically, but I think a general second hour on understanding MIDI, what it is, how it got here, how it works, how to take advantage of it, I think would be super useful. Uh, next question. Next one from Paul Wallace in Austin again, just says sports audio. Yeah, <laughs> I think, I think sports audio understanding like, you know, I don't know again, if, who wants to talk about what, but, you know, understanding how we get the call signs from the, you know, in football or how do we get those types of things or, or even like, I think most people don't know that if you're watching a basketball game, there's probably nearly 30 mics that are, that are picking that up. And so what that actually looks like could be interesting. Um, next question. Claude Waterman uh, says, mixing musicals, get a Broadway designer and or engineer on. Oh yeah, that'd be great. 
We would love to do that. I've watched some of the videos um, that have been out on on that specifically. I think, um, and uh, it'd be it'd be really fun to, to to bring that on specifically. Yeah. Next question. Paul Wallace, Austin, Texas, ham radio audio. I think we do ham radio audio. I mean, I grew up with that. I don't know if we. I don't know if that second hour would resonate with enough people in our group to do that, but it might be possible. Yeah, go ahead, Courtney. Well, Bob Heil, you know, designed most of those dynamic microphones for ham radios. Well, I would bringing Bob Heil on as a second hour would by itself would be, uh, you know, if it would be barely able to fit into into a second hour. But uh, so bringing Bob on would be great. Um, it's just I've and I've tried a couple of times, actually, and just not been successful. Bob and I, you know, talk a lot when we run into each other at different things, but I haven't been able to quite get him lined up with coming on. So we'll, we'll see. Someone else gets his email now. So it's hard. <laughs> so anyway, uh, next, next question. Uh, next question from Jeffrey Powers, tuning your home electromagnetic ma magnetic fields and home audio. It's a really interesting one. You know, I have a, there's, I had to move my desk actually, because there is a field, there is a, there's a, uh, a field in my corner that affects my mics like over there. And I, I was like, maybe I shouldn't sit there either. <laughs> so, so anyway, if it's in my mic, but I get buzz in my mics at a certain angle in a certain place in my room, um, that is that, that something's going on. And it was, you know, my, uh, uh, understanding how stray voltage affects our productions, um, would be interesting because it's stray voltage is actually, I was talking to an electrical engineer and I was like, I really want to learn more about where stray voltage occurs. And he goes, well, it occurs everywhere that there's electronic equipment. <laughs> like just, you know, there's stray voltage. It's just how much, how much stray voltage is, you know, how much uh, voltage is trying to get home. And that's the only thing that's happening there. Yeah. Go ahead, Marty. Yeah. I actually have to test for stray magnetic fields when I'm evaluating a room for uh, an induction loop installation. Um, I was, I've been in several rooms where there was so much electromagnetic energy going on that an induction loop system just would not work for hearing did, did systems. you tell them, you know, it's probably not good for you to be here either. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we can't so run an induction. Just, <laughs> somebody was just telling me about a, a tour they did on a nature trail that was uh, underneath a high voltage power lines. And the guy pulled out a four foot fluorescent bulb, held it up in his hand and it was lit. Yeah. <laughs> just from standing under the power line. Yeah, yeah. And and we, you know, we've had issues. There's a place that we did a show uh, in um, in Sonoma that literally all our batteries just died. Like they were just like, they were dying really fast. Like they were just coming out. We were like, what is going on here? And um, people have said that that happens a lot in that area, you know, and no one really knows why. And I, I, I keep on feeling like I should go back and take tools up there to measure it because... It was literally all our batteries had a quarter of the life that they normally have, and we couldn't, like, it was a the hard thing to calculate. Yeah, go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, we have a ghost spot about 30 minutes north of us, not only just for audio, but also for things like uh, uh, cellular service or anything like that. But also, uh, we wanted, we should probably focus on something, uh, the, the, uh, the weather, basically winter versus summer, uh, yeah. bringing in humidity, dehumidifying, things like that. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Courtney. We don't have too much of this, you know, anymore since most everything's moved to digital. But in the analog days, it was a big problem. But uh, we could also include EMF field meters, you know, to how to detect electromagnetic fields around your house to position things away from them and how to attenuate yeah. them. No, absolutely. Next question. Douglas Carmichael, the Waves Emotion LV1 sound good mixing platform, and he's got a link to it. Yeah, I think that that would, that would be good to bring on. I think we haven't um, brought Waves on, and I think it'd be... It'd be interesting to have them really show us how it all how it all comes together. So I'm definitely open to that. Now, next question. Jeff Cohen, Miami Beach, Florida, the high-tech live DJ, discussion and demo, software and hardware, modern decks versus vinyl virtual queuing. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I think it, it, similar to this, the discussion about live events, th this whole category is just fascinating to me. And I think if we brought in, you know, some some real working DJs that that do this, and, and even you know the almost religious wars of, you know, who are using the modern decks with just you know the little uh, spinners to cue stuff up versus the ones that are using 
vinyl, but virtual vinyl, and and they, uh, which just still controls the same software, um, but it gives them a little, you know, and some are very skilled at that. And but all the 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 automation that's happening that that some people can take advantage of, in terms of mixing and beat matching, and I mean, there's a lot of cool stuff that I think uh, would be interesting. Yeah, I think that that uh, uh, that that software I find it fascinating. I was I DJ a lot. In, in the early days, um, first first uh, raves, then radio, then weddings, because <laughs> the weddings made more money. Anyway, so the um, uh, but uh, weddings and events, and I I remember thinking eventually this is all going to be on a hard drive because it was just like this, you know, stacks and stacks of CDs and and vinyl and tapes and all kinds of stuff that we had that we were bringing in. And I was like, this is just crazy, and this was thirty years ago, and. Uh, and I, and every time I open up the software now, I'm just always amazed at what is possible. And I think that bringing on someone even from like DJ 2.0 or whatever those, you know, those types of so even just the software itself. And we can have a general conversation, but I think that it's it's worthwhile. Uh, next question. Next question comes from Talalik Lopez Waterman. Designing systems. How do you decide what equipment to spec? How to combine what is needed with venue and budget to put together a plan? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Courtney. That's a really broad topic, and it depends on whether you're doing sound reinforcement, sound recording, streaming. You know, each one of them requires different sets of equipment. So I see several second hours on that, dividing yeah. it up into individual types of venues. Et yeah, absolutely. Now, next question. Laura Thompson in Beaumont, Texas says, Dr. Scoff, the space weather woman, to talk about EMF. Yeah. I, if we can, if we can uh, uh, get her on, I'd love to have her come on and talk about that. Uh, next question. Lalek Lopez Waterman, designing a monitor path for your orchestra, avioms, in-ear monitors, click tracks, and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that understanding like just the basics of how these kind of concerts run, you know, with click tracks and and in-ears and, and um, those types of things as, you know, that I think we talked about a little bit before, but how the in-ear monitors can get very complicated. You know, for instance, you might only send the click track to the to the drummer, you might only send it to, or certain people want to hear that, or what the, What parts do they need to hear, what parts do they not want to hear. Uh, I think it'd be really interesting. Now, next question. Harshid Trivedi, Daytona, captioning. What is that? Opened or closed? Bring in the Discord captioning and the multi-language professionals to explain their process. I don't think captioning would probably be on a two, on a Wednesday. I'd probably be on a Friday um, as far as a logistical thing. But I, I think we've, we've had uh, EEG slash AI media come on in the past. Having them come on again, I, this is this market is about to get really, really big and really, really automated all at the same time. <laughs> so, so I think that it's going to be, uh, it, it's definitely worth us keeping track of it. Uh, next question. Claude Luca is back with this one. Thinking about signal path, my opinion is it's the alpha and omega of audio engineering. Yeah, I mean, really understanding your signal path and understanding how it works and the and the workflow and what it's going through. I mean, it's one of the hardest things about audio, and so I don't know how we slice that up for an audio day, but I think that there's a lot of good subjects there to cover. Uh, next question. Rob Collins in Raymore, Missouri. Uh, it's, it's one we've been popular with. Budget sound treatment for a room for better listening and speaking online like in Zoom and Discord. I go, Jeff. Yeah, I think we can't do that fast enough. <clears throat> the problem is, you know, we're kind of preaching to the choir, you know, uh, probably the vast majority of our audience understands this. The real question is, how do we get everyone else to even think about this? I mean, I'm still amazed at, you know, here we are, you know, almost mid-2023, and folks that are appearing on news segments, on major networks, and uh, let alone, I mean, executive CEOs that are having talks, you know, are all so many are still doing this from, you know, it sounds like they're in their bathroom, like no one has said anything to them, like, right. hey, you could fix that. Yeah. Shame and ridicule. <laughs> Go ahead, Marty. <laughs> Yeah, sound sound treatment and sound abatement, uh, really broad topics. Uh, first question of the day was about sound treatment in a square room. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, I'm a... a and for home applications for home office for desktop conferencing, that's that's one very specific area. But sound treatment and, and sound design, I am constantly amazed at how many architects who are building spaces for public consumption of music and speech don't understand acoustics. Yeah. 
they're Absolutely. building these rooms for for communications that just don't work. I we we were dealing with a, a government agency uh, in Europe, and I remember uh, we were talking to them, and and they um, we could barely hear them because it was so echoey. And this is their this is their main conference area. There's like room for twenty people. They bring people in virtually. And they were like, well, we just finished this. We spent millions of dollars on it. And and and, and there's got to be something that's not working. We're like, there's nothing that's not working. It's just echoey. <laughs> like, it just, we can't hear you. We can't hear you talk. And they're like, this, is this all the way it is in Zoom? Or is it the way it is all the time? And we were like, it's the way it is probably all the time. And they were just, there was like this long silence. And I could I could hear the person getting fired. <laughs> like I could hear, in the silence, I could hear somebody, somebody somebody's head's going to roll over this one. Um, anyway, go ahead, Jeff. And I think one thing to really focus on this question is is how to to do that in a budget conscious way uh, for folks that are doing this at home. So many people want to do this at home. I think Mike Delgadio, booth junkie on mm -hmm. YouTube, uh, would be a great guest because he's done a lot of videos where he talks about and demonstrates, um, you know, buying like Owens Corning and but really making that into really effective and cost effective uh, right. panels, how he covers it with fabric. You know, he, he's done a lot of that uh, as well. It would be a great guest to talk about. That. Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, Courtney. I just wanted to mention to Jeff that there's there's a mathematical ratio. The the more money the CEO makes, the more marble and glass they're going to be surrounded with, yeah. and the bigger the echo is going to be. It's <laughs> <Yeah>. guaranteed. <laughs> Next question. Next one comes from Jeff Cohen. Unrelated recommendation, the documentary Sound City, free on YouTube. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I don't know if I'm the last one to the party that, that uh, is just now... Uh, became aware of it it just popped up into my youtube feed and right now i don't know if it's just for youtube it's been, premium but it, it's free to me but while. it's by dave grohl really interesting about the actual sound studio sound city and you know they talk about the the first time they got the neve board and and you know working with him and how revolutionary i mean a lot of cool you know total audio geekery stuff I'm a fiend for uh, documentaries, so that one is definitely pretty high up on the list, um, along with the uh, Eagles. You know, was was a pretty good the the really long Eagles <laughs> Eagles uh, documentary, and a couple others. But that but that Sound City is a must must view. Um, next next question. JJ McKenna, the possibilities behind EVP recording ghosts. Uh, go ahead, Courtney. There's no such thing as ghost, JJ. It's <laughs> print through on audio tape or no harmonic noise. Or, yeah. There's there's real explanations for it. So. Next question. Uh, Talalak uh, Lopez again with, uh, can we talk about ear training? Maybe uh, that is more of a lab? Not sure. I think it'd be fun to do some ear training as a second hour. And I think that this is actually, again, why we're moving towards YouTube as the output it's because I can put a very clean output into YouTube. So we can do things where Zoom may process it a little bit more, even with uh, sound for musicians on, it may not be quite the level that we'd want it to be at. Whereas with, um, you know, there's a couple things that are coming. One is with 5.1, which we experimented with a little bit, um, the ability to talk about surround in a way that where we can actually hear it. You know, that's something that has, I've never seen a class do online is actually, okay, here, you can hear it moving. You can hear it going up and down and around and everything else. And we'll start with 5.1, then we'll look for some other, you know, some other formats. But being able to teach that, my goal is eventually to be able to talk about Atmos and be in, you can online listen to it if you have the, to, you know, the tools to listen to it. And so those are the things we're kind of moving towards. Now, next question. Uh, Tlaloc back, is back again with uh, audio for film. Yeah, I mean, just you know, understanding all the, all the different aspects of that would be would be a lot of fun because there's obviously recording, you know, recording the act, you know, on set, and then there is the recording effects. There's we we've already had some guests on that talked a little bit about foley. Uh, we haven't had someone on that really talked about ADR. So there's a lot of different, and then then there's mixing, and there's a lot of places that we could we could jump into that. Absolutely. Uh, next question. Walt Palmer's up next from Lewis, Delaware. A visit with a jingle house such as PAMS. Yeah, it'd be great to have a jingle house talk about how they put those things together. Um, so I, I'd love to do a session on that. So let's let's keep that that lined up. It'd be really fun. Um, next question. Peter Moore's back from Auckland. Did Office Hours cover the new road stuff? Um, we have carried, I think, some of it. Um, we've talked about it. I don't know if we've done a second hour on it. 
uh, with all of the road stuff, I always look at it going, I don't know if I can do a whole second hour, but we definitely, you know, talk about those things. So um, it comes up in conversation often. Uh, next question. Douglas Carmichael has what is currently our last one. Jonathan Wolfert of Jam Creative Productions, and they do jingles at Jam. I think we just, yeah, that'd be great. I think it'd be make, make a lot of sense. Uh, next question. Claw comes back with a late one. ENG audio, how to really use a mix pre. And ENG <laughs> is electric news gathering, electronic news gathering. And I think it's it's using the mix pre. A lot of times it's directly into camera. When you're talking about ENG, a lot of times all of that stuff is going into camera. And I think getting mics into cameras, I think, is is useful. We dealt with a lot of that at NAB where there's different way how different ways of how we're going to get those into there. So definitely makes sense. Wow, that, that was that was busy. We got through a lot. <laughs> we got through a lot. I, we this is actually the, I think the record number of posts that we've ever uh, had in the system. Um, we, of course, we weren't doing quite Q and A, so I, I think it has an asterisk on it. Um, but uh, but it was a it was a great great session. I think we have enough ideas now. Now it's just a matter of the council and all of us chasing those ideas down. So stay tuned for that um, as we move forward with it, with uh, that process. So thank thank you to the producers for all the great ideas and the brainstorming. Uh, I think it's gonna be really useful as we kind of plan between now and IBC. Thanks to the panelists, of course, we can't do this without you. And thank you to the incredible team on the back end um, that is making this happen before the show, after the show, during the show, all those things. If you're interested in that, there's a volunteer form that goes out, I think, in the email every day. Um, if you're interested in it, it's a great way to meet a lot of people, um, to get to know them and to learn about, you know, how how we're going to keep moving this forward. Uh, I, and I think that, you know, again, we're right at the very beginning of how this works. And I think that beyond just learning the technology of how we're doing office hours, getting used to just working in a global team live every day, it's useful, you know, and, and being comfortable with it because that's the future. So, um, so it'd be great to have you on and you can do that by jumping into the volunteer or, you know, you can look at the volunteer, um, uh, process and, uh, and it's, it's in an email every day. All right. Now uh, we, uh, we traveled a hundred, well, we, we traveled a lot today, 157,000 miles. Um, that's 253,000 kilometers and 1.2 four, five billion bananas for scale. All right, let's jump into after hours. So many ideas. Now do we do a whole second hour just whispering of office hours past? Yeah, exactly. Um, I, I, I think, I don't think we can do a whole hour. I think I could, but, but, you know, we could try, we could try doing, we, we could talk about the skills of whispering. Some people are really good at whispering, and some people are not good at Shockingly, whispering. how many people don't know how to whisper correctly? I know. There's, there is a skill set to whisper. They mix in and out of, like, full volume. It drives exactly. me crazy. And it's not full volume. That's lower. It's a different register. You have to get it just right. It's very important. And you have to articulate differently. in your mind. And when does the zone cross from whispering to ASMR?